This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 617, recorded on May 22nd, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Good afternoon, Vincent. Welcome back. Thank you. Good to have you. I'm always glad to be here. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. We are uh, 89 degrees, headed for 92, right. mostly cloudy. Uh, it's uh, Texas. That's what it is. Texas, Texas barbecue. <laughs> From Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it is uh, gorgeous. It's 79 Fahrenheit, 26 Celsius, uh, just beautiful, a couple of puffy clouds in the sky. Lovely day. From Southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's 61 Fahrenheit again, 16 ah, Celsius. Nice. Two shows in a row. It's partly cloudy, but it's going to go up to 70 and be even warmer over the weekend. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, it is 74 degrees here and kind of gray, kind of cloudy. Really? Yes. Hmm. It was very sunny and uh, blue skies earlier, but it's pretty cloudy now. Well, you're quite different than I am, and I'm not that far away from you. We've got Alan's weather over here. Also joining us from New York State, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. How have you been, Daniel? You know, I've been doing a little better lately, and I think that um, I think that I have some positive things to share today. So I think that uh, that makes me feel a little bit better. All right. Well, let's hear it. Well, I, I was going to start with a Winston Churchill quotation. <laughs> you guys ready for this? Yeah, <laughs> ready. <laughs> uh, so uh, this Winston Churchill, I give him credit. Um, and and at one point, uh, it'd be interesting, I should, maybe one of our emailers will write it and tell us exactly when this was said. Uh, but at one point, Winston Churchill said, now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I thought that that was interesting um, because le let's not make the same mistakes um, during this um, this lull, this pause that we have um, right now um, so that we are ready for um, any potential problems or what is being um, suggested to be a potential second wave um, coming this fall. Actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, I know... Um, uh, is it is it Rich who always makes the prediction that um, it's all going to be good and then it it isn't? <laughs> but, well, uh, <laughs> I don't know about that, but I'm usually wrong. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so. so 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 Rich, please predict it's going to be a really bad second wave because oh, it's um, going to be terrible. I, yeah, I kind of I kind of agree with you, unfortunately. But um, just for starters, I will say um, it is now today was the second day at Plainview Hospital in um, in the New York area where we did not have a new COVID admission, hmm. and that that is um, tremendous. I, I I say that's a fantastic thing. So we are getting to the point where a lot of um, a lot of patients are becoming um, PCR negative, right? So um, they're getting past that infective stage. We're really getting to a very lull. I mean, we still have over 100 deaths a day in the state of New York, I think I, I heard the uh, governor say today. So we're not, you know, we're not in a perfect world, but we are in a much better world than we were for a period of time there. Mike, uh, um, Daniel, how long does it take to become PCR positive? Uh, so this this is an interesting issue. How long does it take to become PCR positive? How I'm long sorry, negative. I meant up? negative. Yeah, well, right. you know, you, you seg right into my second thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about testing. Um, so I get a lot of questions every day um, from uh, from the providers in the in the New York area, pro health doctors. But I also get um, emails and calls from people just sort of around a little broader, um, which is great. I love that there's all this communication going on. Hopefully, hopefully this communication um, and this new paradigm of everyone um, being so open um, continues. So um, let's keep that. No one silo up, please. Um, you know, uh, business is one thing, but uh, health, you know, is, is something hopefully that gets beyond that. Um, one of the things is um, people get a couple tests. One, we now see this new test where people get a, a PCR result and it says the patient is pan 
coronavirus positive, but SARS-CoV-2 negative. And they, they, they call me or they send me a screenshot of what does this mean? And um, I bet all the TWIV listeners right now are like, I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is your little bonus for uh, listening to real science. Um, and basically what they're doing is, is there are um, – certain um, PCR primers that will pick up the common coronaviruses. So OC43, 229E, NL63, or HKU1. Um, and actually, I bet our listeners can all just, just roll off the tongue now. Um, those are the, the common non-SARS coronaviruses that circulate. Um, and they still, interesting enough, are still circulating despite this pause order. Um, and occasionally we'll see that a, a patient has those, one of those, um, but that they don't have COVID um, uh, disease. They don't have the SARS-CoV-2. Um, so that's what that means. So when you see that, when the clinicians see that, or when a patient sees that, um, we actually had an interesting issue where it was uh, one of the embassies uh, shut down in, in New York City because the uh, the person got that result. And then the embassy uh, shut down and we're like, no, no. And we tried to explain that there were uh, coronaviruses that were not SARS-CoV-2, but that pretty much fell on deaf ears at that point. Is that uh, coming off of two different tests? Uh, so it's actually a multiplex now. So instead so of so they've got SARS CoV two on the multiplex. Exactly. Exactly. Ooh. Now this isn't the full multiplex, right? That we discussed at some point the respiratory pathogen panel, where there's 18 different viruses. There's um, a few bacteria like mycoplasma and chlamydia and things like that. Um, but it is on this um, this PCR test that people are doing. So it's a COVID PCR plus. So you got to know your stuff, dude. You got to listen to Twiv. Yeah, you know? and I think every everybody is learning, which is I think this is all fantastic. Um, so that that explains that um, the PCR we think turns positive even before symptoms. Um, but as we're seeing now, and I had a call just um, earlier today, I got the message from the office. Um, you know, this patient is on the phone. She's crying. Um, you just saw her Tuesday. And so I call this woman back. We just did a, we did a telehealth visit on Tuesday. And um, she is calling me to say that she, her first PCR was positive March 24th. Um, and she just got the call today that her repeat PCR, she had gone to an urgent care earlier in the day before she saw me on Tuesday. And that PCR came back. Can we guess? Positive, still positive. positive. Yeah, positive. And so the, here we are eight weeks later. And she's still PCR positive. So I had to ask my son, eight times seven, what is that? It's like 56. <laughs> so um, it really, and she very upset. She's like, well, what is going on here? And so, you know, we are seeing people who continue to be PCR positive for two months. Um, and as we've talked at the TWIV listers, right? We don't know that that means that the person is shedding viable virus, um, but that's kind of a really long time to remain PCR positive. So we can't, we can't, assure her or reassure her that she is now no longer infectious, where we are, I think, comfortable saying that if you've had two PCR tests more than 24 hours apart that remain um, negative, then, you know, we're, we're saying you're at very low risk for shedding, even cautious in how we say that. But if you continue to be PCR positive, we're not um, able to say with confidence, hey, you don't have to worry anymore. What it would sure, be, of sure be nice to <laughs> assay virus on these people. Yeah, well, need a BSL-3 for that. Um, at what fraction of patients shed for longer than, say, six weeks? You know, I don't I don't think we really have good data on that. Um, okay. You know, I, I get a, a sort of disproportionate odd sampling, right? Because mm -hmm. that that is a referral to infectious disease at this point. If someone is still shedding um, past about six weeks, then usually like, can you see them? And part of it is, you know, I talk to them. And um, the interesting thing I'll say, not only um, do people potentially shed for quite a long period of time, um, but some people are having sort of this later wave of symptoms. The woman I talked to, today, in addition, was she being PCR positive, um, what prompted her to go get checked again was she had had a recurrent loss of smell. 
Hmm. So now she's like, hey, you know, I was sick in March. I lost my sense of smell and taste. That resolved. I was feeling better. Here I am now. And her complaints now were I, again, have lost my um, sense of smell and taste. Um, my hands, I, I have um, pain in my hands. And I'm actually starting to have this issue with mucus production where when I cough, um, I just feel like I've got this thick stuff that won't come up. So um Seeing a couple people, actually, I saw another woman on um, Tuesday, and by C, I did a telehealth visit with her. Very similar symptoms, um, PCR positive out well past a month, and then sort of this late stage of uh, joint hand, I'll say arthralgias, um, so joint pains um, with this feeling of like a thick mucus that they can't clear. So, um, I think you've said before that you don't, you, you often discharge patients that are still PCR positive because they've clinically recovered, right? Yeah, th this is a moving target, and um, a few of us uh, uh, infectious disease doctors were socially distanced and having this conversation. So <laughs> I'm always entertained by the dynamic. <laughs> you know, we've got our you know masks on and loud voices and distanced <laughs> a little bit here. Um, but there, there were a couple stages to how we dealt with um, the PCR positivity. So early on in the in the pandemic, um, early on as in you know. March, uh, early April, uh, the hospitals were sort of sitting there right at capacity. So there was a whole um, dynamic going on where patients were being discharged from the hospital. They were still PCR positive. They would be discharged either to home. I, I felt okay with that. Um, a lot of them were being discharged back to facilities, right? Hmm. And at that point, there was an executive order from Cuomo saying, you know, the facilities, you got to take these people. The hospitals are overwhelmed. Um, the hospitals had made a decision not to set up tents, not to expand capacity and to work with a paradigm where these people are being sent back to the um, to the nursing homes, uh, hmm. rehabilitation hmm. centers, the group homes, et cetera. Um, and there was even an active um discouragement, I guess I will say, for um, the these facilities to send patients to the hospital. There was sort of a, you know, unless they need hospital level services, um, we're not going to take people who are potentially contagious out of these facilities. Y you've got to somehow try to handle that. Um, and so we were discharging patients to home and to facilities who were still PCR positive. And um, the discussion we're having today was really saying like, gosh, I feel really kind of bad about what happened, because then what we would see is some of the nursing homes who have um, maybe then not not the same amount of resources and so not the same access to personal protective equipment, maybe not the same ability to provide their staff with the same training and safety. Um, some of them tried to set up like COVID floors to sort of cohort them. Um, but what we saw is facilities that maybe had a couple cases of COVID would now receive um, a number of admissions of people who were still PCR positive, but did not require um, acute hospital care. And then it would spread through the facility and we'd see, you know, dozens, hundreds. I mean, fortunately, I think the numbers have now come out. Thousands of individuals in the facilities in New York died. Um, and it's hard for me not to see that that um, discharging people who were still PCR positive played a, a role in, in that escalation. Um, so things changed. Mm -hmm. And um, now there's a mandate um, from the governor saying that before a person can be sent back to a facility or a person can even be just discharged to a facility in general, um, you need to show a negative PCR. And that's created some surprises for us in the hospital where a person came in, there was no clinical suspicion at all for um, COVID. The reason they get a test um, was just because you had to check this box and now they're, they get a COVID PCR positive. Um, we had a patient today, it actually went for um, a surgical procedure and um, they now do um, PCRs before the surgical procedures because they're trying to do a lot of this elective um, surgery. And this person actually had two negative PCRs, um, went for their elective procedure. It was not quite elective, right? We're trying to do things that need to be done, not like you're not in getting your um, facelift. Um, the person had um, fever, raised enough concern that a COVID test was done, and they came back PCR positive. So, um, so wait a minute, that is how long after the surgery? Uh, this was actually 24 hours after the surgery. So they had a post-op fever. Um, and then so this triggered uh, COVID PCR. PCR was positive. So they, I don't think they acquired it during the surgery. I think they came in with it. Right. Um, mm. Yeah. But at an undetectable uh, level. 
Um, the interesting, well, it shows, I think, um, and this is a nice segue. I know that um, people on Twiv, I listen to Twiv when I'm not um, talking, <laughs> when I'm <laughs> driving around in my car. I always uh, try to listen to the last part of the episode where I've usually had to run. It takes me several days. I'm still actually behind on Twiv listening. Um, but there was a Twiv discussion about these negative and positive predictive values, sensitivity yeah. of tests. Right. Um, and actually, this, I think, is really important for the clinician. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time here. Um, so when we talk about sensitivity and specificity of tests, what we actually care about as a as a clinician, what we care about as a patient is um, when you tell me the test is positive, when you tell me the test is negative, uh, how much can I trust that? What's the predictiveness that what you're telling me is is accurate, so to speak? Um, so, you know, if a disease prevalence is very low, and I'm going to use some real numbers here, let's say it's a 1% disease prevalence, it's very low. Um you sort of go into the testing with, well, 99%, I can tell you without doing a test that you don't have it. And then you do a test that's maybe 80% sensitive. And those are sort of the numbers I think we can say are um, for a well-done um, nasopharyngeal or, or one of these um, PCR tests. And 99% specific, I think they're very specific unless there's contamination in your system. Um, then if it's negative, you know, you're, you're close to 100%. It's like 999 when you do the math on that. Um, for saying this is really negative uh, predictive value. But if it's positive, so um, I should, actually, I'm going to rewind that a little. The, if the sensitivity is only 80%, I'm going to say you're going to miss 20% of um, the positives. But if the prevalence is so low, that's why I could say 99.9, .9, you're negative. So you can actually increase your negative prediction. But once the prevalence starts to go up, so let's say the prevalence is now, you know, 10% in your community um, and you're missing 80% of those, um, then you start having it, more issues with your negative and your positive predictive values. Right. <laughs> So sort of moving moving targets at a challenge for us. So mm -hmm. when the prevalence is really low, let's say you go out to somewhere, we'll, we'll go to Alaska and you get a negative test and you're probably doing pretty good. You're not going to miss a lot. Um, but when you're in the New York area where we still have a, a certain number of cases, um, that negative test, it's going to it's going to miss stuff, particularly when there's sensitivity issues. And then maybe I'll even move beyond that. Certain labs um, have issues. Um and that also is an issue with the serology testing I should bring up um, because that's the next thing I get a lot of questions from clinicians about. So I'll, I'll address that next. So what does a serology, a positive or negative serology mean um, for us as clinicians? Um, this is one of those tests where a lot of um, patients have been requesting them. And they've said, boy, I really want to get this test. And then they get the test. And um, let's say it's positive. Um, and this is, they're, they're usually very happy because in some part of their brain, they've said, well, if it's positive, I am somewhat hopeful that I'm now immune. We, will, we, will, we, we discourage any clinicians from, from using that word um, because we do not know and we will not know until probably the next wave what percent of people with positive serologies get sick, what percent don't, and how that compares to people who are negative. Um, people are usually quite disappointed when they get a negative test. Um, but then there's issues where I think I mentioned on one of the prior twibs where we've had a lot of patients who were PCR positive, got sick, and then they come back with a negative serology test. Hmm. Um, and so what we've actually, um, several, I'll say, of the uh, systems of the hospitals of the facilities in our area have actually switched over to, a, I'll say, a better platform, the Roche platform. Um, which I know has been discussed on TWIV, um, you know, different tests have different sensitivity and specificities, and you really want high sensitivity and specificity coupled with the knowledge of the disease prevalence to really make sense of any of that that data. So we still, um, you know, it, patients are loving getting those serology tests. Um, clinicians are ordering them. Um, we won't know what to do with them until we get ourselves um, into the fall into uh, another wave, and then we can actually um, get some sense of what those meant. So are there any, <clears throat> let's start, let's just do PCR. Are there any PCR assays that are close to 100% uh, accurate? You know, the Roche, the Roche seems to be the best when you look at it. Um, there's a lot of assays that are not even reviewed by the FDA, and so you really have no sense. Um, the other is until you road test those, and I think that was the issue that um, the White House ran into. Uh, 
Mm. Um, so they, they've got that little, it was the Abbott test, I believe. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, the, the way you look at it and the demo is great. Here's this machine. You swap the person, you take that Q-tip, you put it right into the machine, you push some buttons. And so many minutes later, you get a result. Now you start thinking about that's great, but how do the logistics work? So here's the White House. Um, I'm going to use them as an example. Um, are they going to get each individual to stand a few feet away from the machine? The swab goes in the nose, goes right in the machine, just like you tested it. You know, um, No, it's going to be, oh, we put the swab in here. And we ran into this as well because we have about 20 machines at the different pro health sites. You put the swab in the person's nose. Now you got to get from that person's nose to the machine. And, you know, that machine might be in another room. So am I going to take this Q-tip and put it back in the paper sleeve and basically wipe all the mucus and everything off onto the paper sleeve? Am I going to stick it into a little bit of viral media and, and wash all the virus off? Or am I somehow going to have a mobile machine? But no, that's a problem. So we we actually had to shut down using um, our machines because we ran into the same issue as the White House hmm. is um, the workflow actually disrupted the sensitivity. So um, when we compared that, I think other people, when they compared the sensitivity of the Abbott machine in the real world with all the sort of workflow issues, sensitivity was down under 50%. Wow. 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 Right? So that's, you know. It's a big problem. And I guess similar issues with serology. Some are really good and others are not. I think the Roche test is very good, right? Yeah, the Roche, Roche test is, I'll say, a truly superior test. Um, I know some of these people who do internal validations claim their tests are superior. I'm not sure how they do the internal validation. Um, but, <laughs> um, but you know, I th I would say yes with the the Roche, and, and it is it's really critical for us when we're trying to figure out anything. But again, you know, a superior test or not, we're not even sure what that superior value means, um, as far as what's going to happen when you're re-exposed to the virus. Yeah. So sure. the Roche test is an ELISA, is that correct? Uh, yes. So this is not something where that's really a point of care type test. This is a, uh, you have to have an established lab running this test, right? Uh, that is true. Okay. Yeah. That's not a dipstick type thing. Right. Yeah. There are, you know, the lateral flow tests that um, I think uh, Henry Schein brought in from South Korea where, you know, it's a, it's a quick point of care, you know, prick your finger. It's a lateral flow. Like I think like a pregnancy type test where you're then looking at the colors mm -hmm. of the lines, um, you know, and you have issues there with sensitivity and specificity mm -hmm. right. that, um, you know, the Roche test, at least from what we've seen is superior. Um, and now I'm actually seeing um, that being used. That's actually ProHealth has adopted the Roche platform, um, which I was quite happy about, right? Because you're not going to end up with mm -hmm. much at all in the way of cross reactivity. You know, it's well under like 0.2% cross reactivity. Um, if it's even that high, I'll say. Um, so the, the specificity is and sensitivities are both quite high for detecting what you're detecting. Now, what, what that actually means, what those antibodies actually mean, is again, we're not going to know until people have been exposed to the virus and we can see a correlation between um, serology levels and protection or not from the virus. Mm -hmm. So what's, uh, uh, actually, are you done with your clinical update? No, no, I still had a couple oh. more, but I, I paused Let's there go. to the, the pregnant pause. <laughs> you guys can jump in. <laughs> um, now, the the other, we get, a, we get a lot of questions about this, is summer camps, schools, all the different activities. I, I, I saw that there were a few emails about uh, playing tennis, and I guess, you know, when someone hits you the tennis ball, you either have to get out of the way, hit it with your racket, or somehow scoop it up with your foot. Um, <laughs> so you're not like wiping, wiping the back of your hand or the front of your hand, and then, you know, slobbering up that tennis box tennis balls right they're kind of uh, absorbent there um but so that yeah we've seen tennis open in our area uh we're starting to see people out there um, at least with tennis right you're either the other side of the court but there was a discussion i was a part of last night where maybe they're going to allow doubles which will be an interesting dynamic just don't crash into <laughs> your partner and <laughs> no cheek to jowls there you know keep keep your six feet away somehow um 
And then the, actually the testing issue is going to come up when it comes to schools and summer camps, right? At the, uh, I, one of my other jobs, right? I think I've mentioned jobs last time. Um, so apparently it's extra hours in the day. And during those extra hours, I'm the chair of the largest sailing program on the North Shore of Long Island. And traditionally during non-pandemic times, we have about 200 um, children um, out there sailing on the bay. And so we're trying to figure out how can such a thing be safely done if we're given permission by the governor. And um, one of the aspects that we incorporated a few years back were, were lice checks, right? We try to check all the kids um, for lice so we wouldn't have lice outbreaks, which you know, I love that from my parasitic um, <laughs> background you know i hate hate to kill the poor parasites but uh it, it usually makes for a better camp experience for the children um and now is the issue are there ways of testing uh children with these um rapid or not so rapid viral detection tests and so um not only do they have the the nucleic amplification testing the the typical pcr um but there's also um the the isothermal amplification um testing and there's even um potentially going to be some uh point of care antigen um testing with rapid turnaround so this is all going to be very interesting again these are uncharted waters we've never done this kind of a um uh, process. Um, and we're waiting for the state to tell us, you know, what can and we can't do. So I know a lot of clinicians get um, questions and um, we don't really know. I think so we get to just sort of say, I don't know, but um, we're waiting for um, guidance. Um, the CDC has already put out nice uh, parameters because this is a state by state and certain states are already pretty much preparing that they're going to go ahead and have um, summer camps. So that's going to be an interesting issue. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention before, um, it's really two last points. Um, one day it was sort one is sort of an update on that late stage, um, issue. And as I brought up with a couple patients I was seeing this week, um, we seem to be seeing, uh, adults who continue to shed virus, continue to be, I think it will be specific, continue to have positive nucleic amplification tests out as far as two months. We don't know if that's virus shedding. We don't know if that's just remnant um, genetic material. Um, but we're also seeing um, patients who complain of these late stage symptoms. Um, and I mentioned the, the joint pain, pains in the joints of the fingers, and then this thick mucus issue. It, it's really hard for us to know at this point is that really like a late stage? Will there be a post-inflammatory um, issue to this or not? And so we're still learning. Uh, but this is one of those things where our clinicians are um, doing quite a bit of telehealth with these people. Um, sometimes even from just a mental health perspective, it's really important for these individuals to at least once a week be able to check in with their physician, um, get an update, get some reassurance. Because, you know, as I described that woman I talked to today, you know, when she calls the office, she's crying on the phone with the staff, but, you know, just maybe a 10 minute phone call, walking her through this, talking to her, some reassurance, um, give her some advice. This is all critical. Um, so telehealth has been fantastic for allowing us, um, to, to keep in touch with our patients. Um, the last thing, and this is where I'll sort of leave, um, I was going to skip vaccines and therapeutics because we're still, we're still in a zone where we don't know. Um, and we're still waiting for guidance. Um, but that's the sort of preparing for the next wave. Um, uh, one of the nice, um, new hats that I acquired over the last couple of months was I got involved with the United Health Group and, um, uh, Deneen Volta is actually the person there that I connected with. And this, this group is really looking at when we come into the next wave, can we be prepared to take advantage of, um, the learning opportunities there? Um, so this is going to be potentially having, um, early therapeutic um, trials set up. So when your patient comes in, your patient calls, your patient gets diagnosed, we have the option to enroll them in trials. So we'll be able to say, let's try this antibody or this antiviral, or we're actually looking at a large 100,000 plus person um, vaccine um, mm. trial. So a lot of the clinicians, you know, sort of encouragement, start thinking about that next wave and what we're going to do and how we're going to address it. Um, we're also hoping that there's thoughts relative to the hospitals and the facility relationships so that we have the volume that we need next time. I mean, we don't really, um, in the discussion we had today, we're not excited to send people who are still potentially shedding virus back to these facilities or encouraging those facilities to just have patients 
die there if we could set up tents, do all the other things to mobilize and, and have the capacity, hopefully, to do a better job um, this coming fall and winter. I wonder if some of these uh, individuals who <laughs> seem to have uh, a persistent infection would not, wouldn't be good candidates for antiviral therapy. I, you know, I think that what we would love to have is an assessment of these people who stay PCR positive. Is this still active virus? Because, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it's, you know, I, I, you know, I think y'all were talking about what is it about 4,000 papers a week are um, mm-hmm. showing up on preprints and other things. Um, I'm waiting for one of those to show up <laughs> where uh, right. um, we really get a sense is, is this active viral shedding mm-hmm. or just remnants? Because if the, if there is a subgroup of people, and I think this is a huge issue for the hospitals and, and discharge um, disposition issues, you know, if this is just remnant RNA and these people are not infectious, that's huge. Uh, I think it also helps from a social standpoint is, you know, can this person, you know, leave that basement room where the food is being delivered and they're self-isolating and, and, and get back to the family. And because it's a psychological impact, the human impact of not knowing this is tremendous. So, um, I would love to have that information. Take, take these secretions, um, and let us know what that PCR means relative to, is this viable virus? Um, and if so, then, you know, as mentioned, these would be people that would be potentially amenable to antiviral strategies. I just, uh, I, I'm sure these are ongoing somewhere. The problem is going to be you're not going to get black and white. You know, you're going to get a certain percentage shed for a, infectious virus for a long time, and that makes it difficult because you can't just generalize to say after 60 days there's no more infectious virus, right? No, and you're right because we want to know in that individual, not just sort of oh, by the way, you know, we don't yeah. want, we don't want a probability um, because you send them to a facility. Let's say and now it spreads through that facility, and you know that that one mistake can translate into you know 300 people being exposed in a facility. Yeah, Daniel. A while ago, we heard about saliva being a wonderful way to test, and haven't heard anything. Do you know if anything's happening there? Yeah, you know, it seems like that sort of um, sort of stopped at one point, right? We we found that there was some um, interesting data there. There was even some movement, right, for some home testing, um, yeah. and then there were some concerns that came up um, relative to uh, the sensitivity there. Um, so that that's been a little bit of a pause, much like the entire state of New York, um, and we're waiting to hear because I'll tell you when we talk about testing the kids right before camp, I would much prefer, and I think the children and the families much prefer if this was a yeah mouth swab versus you, know, you keep sticking these Q-tips in people's, you know, noses. And, you know, eventually I was saying today, eventually they're going to be negative because there's going to be no mucous membrane left back there. <laughs> it's all going to be like scabbed and scarred up. Mm, wow. Another thing we get a lot of email on TWIV about is whether vitamin D uh, can is effective in any way or does leads to better recovery. Do you know anything there? You know, there there is a huge push um, to to find to to believe that um, certain vitamins and supplements and non prescription therapeutics um, can play a role um, in in COVID nineteen. Sure, sure. Um, you know, and you can imagine why, right? Because this is something then everyone can treat COVID nineteen, and everyone can you know feel like they're doing something. Um, and it, it's an interesting argument because you know one of the arguments is that oh, if I take vitamin D, I'm going to have a more robust immune system. So that might be good, that might be bad. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it reminds me of the the iron deficiency. Um, studies in um, sub-Saharan Africa that I know we talked about uh, this week in um, parasitism with Dixon. There was this tremendous idea that, oh my gosh, all these sub-Saharan children are iron deficient. Let's give them iron supplements, treat that anemia. And then they they wanted to make sure that they could demonstrate to the world that this multi-billion dollar project really was making a difference and ended up with you know a tripling of the childhood mortality because mm. the improving the anemia... It, led to a more robust immune response to the malaria, which ended up, you know, I mean, three times the number of children died. It was a disaster, but it was a really good message that you, you got to be careful. Um, 
you know, with people who have vitamin D deficiencies or high enough levels, is that good or bad? Because what tends to be getting us into trouble in this disease is that second week, is this robust immune system. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, during the first week, you want vitamin D to be at a good level to fight the virus, I think. During the second week, somehow we want to make them vitamin D deficient to calm that down. So I don't know. And again, it's something that um, I'm waiting for good data because, again, I don't want to do harm. So we had an email from an infectious disease fellow at George Washington University who said she heard recently about recommending Maravarak to COVID-19 inpatients, and she wanted to know if you knew anything about that. You know, so it is something I've definitely heard about, and I haven't, you know, again, I haven't seen, you know, good good data um, really helping yeah. to sort that out. But yeah, that is actually, you know, among the 100 things that are being studied, it's it's in the mix. That's an that's an HIV antiviral which targets CCR5, right? The chemokine receptor. So that would not be an antiviral effect. That would be an immune effect, right? It would be sort of a cellular protective uh, yeah. effect, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, Bill wanted to know how physicians keep up with discoveries, how they learn about discoveries and put them into use. And Bill said particularly like proning patients and the use of remdesivir. How do you keep up in a pandemic? <laughs> You know, it's a great question because we we weren't trained to um, keep up in a pandemic, right? The the normal um, medical model is much like the the scientific model, right? You want to you want to wait, you want peer reviewed things, you want to then you know get together at a conference and and you discuss it and what do we think and what are the the failings of a particular study, why we can apply it to our patients or not. Uh, mm-hmm. But the pandemic has changed um, that dynamic. So there is a lot of communication um, between physicians, um, you know, and for instance, proning is a perfect one where there was really good real time feedback on the the benefit of that. Um, you know, I think it took a t- little bit of time for it to make it to the New York Times, but um, it was widespread and in use among um, clinicians. Um, but a lot of it has has been it's changed the paradigm of medicine. It's been um, people listening to this week in virology. Actually, there are tens of thousands of clinicians, actually, that I'm always shocked when I get an email. It's like, wow, you, you too. Who, who doesn't listen? Um, so that's been tremendous. So thanks to the scientific community, people like, um, you know, Vincent, you guys, um, uh, the, the TWIV team. Um, but then there's also been people who are trying to somehow scour through the literature. And then a lot of it has been all this informal communication because, you know, I, I was just got an email yesterday um, and it was uh, an invite to be on the advisory board for anticoagulation recommendations um, through the American Society of Hematology. Um, and um, it, I was nominated by um, someone at the ID Society of America to be on this panel. And if you look at some of the guidance, the guidance is basically nine, you know, subsets. And the summary is we can't recommend for or against anything. And that sort of leaves you like, you know, um, sort of stuck, you know, and there are certain things that we have actually done, which we feel, you know, made a difference, right? Proning seemed to make a difference, um, waiting a bit to put people on ventilators and seeing that that actually was okay, Um but then there's a lot of stuff where we really need the hard science to to let us know the randomized controlled trials, so we don't fall into all those paradigms. I think I discussed at one point of uh, you know selective memory of deciding that we uh, we we remember properly what worked and what didn't. So, so with something yeah, he, like proning patients, there's uh, there's no, if I understand it correctly, there's like no formal channels for communicating these sorts of things it just sort of circulates by word of mouth you know that that is interesting um in that normally there would be um you know societies giving us um, recommendation and societies are always good professional organizations always good about you know rating things what's the strength of evidence Uh, but we're kind of in a world of expert opinion um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot of it is people sharing their experiences and then um, hopefully you're at a center with enough of a volume where you can get some sense if it works or not. So I think we went through this. We talked about, you know, evidence, eminence, vehemence, eloquence, diffidence, <laughs> experience, <laughs> like all the different approaches. And we're sort of in this odd limbo of experience-based medicine where, you know, 
things are being tried. There's this feedback in real time. We're trying to amass the observations, um, but it's very hard because this this is something where you are fraught to uh, liable to make errors. So yeah, we are we are trying to get back to where we wanted to be, and hopefully, it's sort of what I'm encouraging during the lull is let's hit the fall with all our randomized control trials ready to go. Um, let's all play nice, right? Because we had an issue here with the research trials. A lot of research trials just barely got set up a couple weeks ago, and then the patients were gone. And then so you had sort of this Mm -hmm. fighting over like, well, that patient should be in my trial and no, they should be in my trial. And so, um, you know, yeah, we we in certain areas of the country, the numbers went down. The trials are having issues recruiting. But, um, you know, every, you know, the the majority of experts are um, anticipating a bad fall in winter. Um, So let's let's make sure that we we get something good out of it. Let's make sure those trials are in place um, and patients can be enrolled in trials, not sort of contaminated in the ER with like some cocktail. Um, So we can figure out what really works because um, I like to point out this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, So let's make sure that we, you know, do what we need to do in the next few months so that the trials are ready to go um, in the fall and winter. Um, as we know with the with the vaccine trials, there's, you know, once you get to a certain point, your patients who've been vaccinated need to actually have exposure to the virus to determine if it makes a difference or not. Um, I don't see how we're going to have that experience um, until the next wave um, comes and people who've been vaccinated get exposed. So uh, let, let me go back to a, a minute just to clarify on something like proning patients, do you do you have a sense of where that idea arose? Can you tell me how you heard about it and how somebody out in the sticks might hear about it? Yeah, so proning actually came out of the ICU experience, and it was something that was used um, in acute respiratory distress syndrome for for years. Um, there okay. actually are special. I mean, it's enough of a thing in. Um, ICU medicine, intensive care unit medicine, um, that there actually are special expensive proning beds. And these are beds, they're they're really kind of scary, I have to say. They look like a rotisserie where the person is inside (laughs) these elliptical um, wheels and the person is then rotated uh, because, you know, you're connected to different lines. You might have a line in an artery to do, um, you know, arterial blood pressure monitoring. You might be on the ventilator. So you've actually got uh, a tube coming out of your mouth, which is then um, attached to a machine. So as you're rotating the person, you need to maintain that um, and all the other monitoring that goes on. So um, at some of the hospitals, instead of a proning team, they have these expensive beds and by pushing a few buttons or, or it's a crank in the original ones, um, the entire bed would rotate and put the person in different uh, physical positions. So that's a, uh, that was a, a sufficiently established concept in a respiratory disease so that it was an obvious thing to try. Exactly. So it was already okay. established. And then what we did is basically started trying it in, in this disease. And I think I described the first, uh, the Irish patient, right, who was mm-hmm. um, one of the first mm-hmm. patients. And we basically were at wit's ed, right? Here was this gentleman, you know, young man um, who was dying before our eyes. His oxygen saturations were dropping down. Um, and we said, you know, this is something, let's do this. The proning team was assembled. Um, This man was switched um, to be belly down. We now effectually call, uh, give him some tummy time. And um, his saturations came right up into the 90s in a matter of minutes, right? So it was really like in front of your eyes, you saw a man go from desaturating and um, dying to the saturations going into the 90s. And, you know, at least in that case, we had a good outcome. By the way, we received our oximeter today. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> Nobody's going to catch me with a <laughs> low oxygen saturation by surprise. <laughs> okay. So, Daniel, I also want to mention uh, parasiteswithoutborders.com, where we've been trying to do summaries of the clinical literature, and that, and there are many other places like that around. Journals have been doing that, and I suppose that also helps clinicians as well, right? You know, that actually has been super helpful. So thank you to you and, and uh, Chuck Kanersh and Dixon de Pamir and everyone who contributes. So the um, I'm not sure who's the sister. Maybe we're both sisters. Microbe TV is sisters with Parasites Without Borders. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Parasites Without Borders, I I go there myself, right, to make sure it's been updated and, and to read the articles that get put there. But yeah, several sites like parasiteswithoutborders.com um, 
do these uh, literature updates. And so you go to the COVID update site, you click on there. And, um, you know, that's helpful because, you you know, a lot of the stuff, particularly preprints, you really don't want to read just the title. You don't want to just read the abstract. You got to actually take the time um, and you can't read all 4,000. So you've got to pick ones that are curated like this is and then read through and really get a sense of is this something that is going to change the way I take care of patients um, mm-hmm. And I, I think that's really critical. So, yeah, I guess I should I should sort of say for, you know, I know for a lot of the clinicians and listeners, these are hard, hard times economically. Um, but, yeah, if if they can contribute and help people like you, Vincent, with Microbe TV or the people at Parasites Without Borders by, you know, just give a, a few dollars here and there, it can add up so we can keep doing that. I know as a clinician, um, this this stuff helps us save lives. So So thank you for all the efforts and the people that support that. So our last email is from Jeff, who asks, if people with well-treated no viral load, uh, HIV, uh, without underlying disease, are at increased normal or decreased risk of morbidity or mortality related to SARS-2 infection? So we don't we don't know the answer, um, but what I will I will say in the New York experience. So um, Joe McGowan, right, is an infectious disease um, HIV specialist that I, I worked with. Even when I first came to Columbia, I would still every Tuesday go um, out to uh, to take care of patients with Joe McGowan. Fantastic guy, I have to say. Um, you know, if I ever ended up with HIV or a loved one um, did, he he would definitely be at the top of people I would recommend. Um, and he has about 2,000 HIV patients that he takes care of. So it's a large um, cohort, um, part of a, a clinical AIDS um, center. Um, um, we also have a, a, a large number of HIV patients that we take care of uh, through ProHealth. And then Columbia has actually a couple thousand. And one of the, the nice things I'll say about the well-controlled patients that, that come in is they were really good about sheltering in place. Um, I was actually just doing a telehealth, a couple telehealth visits this Tuesday with patients, and they really, um, they took it to heart. They stayed home. They were super careful. Um, so, you know, if, you know, if they're well treated and they're compliant and they do the right things, they, they actually did quite well. So we saw a very low admission rate, um, among these collections of HIV infected patients in the, in the New York area. Um, but we don't know the, the exact, um, impact. We're going to see this, I'm certain, in um, sub-Saharan Africa, um, particularly mm-hmm. concerned about Baduda, Uganda, where the this weekend parasitism listeners probably know I own a couple cows and, and, spend, and have spent time. Um, there you're going to see populations where 10, 20 percent of the population is HIV infected, and you're really going to be able to see, um, is there an impact, um, mm-hmm. a, a co-infection issue between these two viruses? By the by, the way, the uh, the end of the beginning speech, yes, was yeah. uh, November nineteen forty two. After to the Churchill talking to the House of Commons after a series of defeats in uh, from Dunkirk to Singapore, uh, they he declared victory in what he called the Battle of Egypt, where Alexander and Montgomery uh, turned back Rommel's forces at El Alamein. So this was uh, a glimmer of hope in what had been a dismal series for the British, but I note that it was uh, scarcely halfway through the war. Wow. So maybe this is more appropriate than I realized when I put it in there. Cause, <laughs> but no, because I, I do feel like we've we've won the first battle. We've at least in New York, we've really uh, stemmed stemmed the tide, so to speak. Um, and now the you know the before us is let's let's win the war. Let's let's not um, waste this precious time that we have to prepare for the next wave. Maintain vigilance. Yes, dude. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Oh, take care. If you like what we do here on TWIV, that is bring you the weather, consider supporting us. <laughs> Welcome to this week Apparently. in meteorology. Yeah. That's right. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Alan, you had a follow-up about tennis. <laughs> yes. So we had a question uh, last Friday. Somebody wanted to know about tennis, which is a subject dear to my family's hearts. Um, and in fact, the, the, I think it was Saturday, I got this email um, about uh, the new USTA guidelines for playing tennis in the age of COVID-19. Um, and most of it is the stuff we talked about already, but uh, the listener had specifically asked about picking up the ball. Um, 
And so the official guidelines from the USTA are that you should open two cans when you're playing singles. You open two cans of tennis balls that don't have the same number or that are, or that are different brands. Um, so you take one set and your playing partner takes the other set. And then whenever you're picking up a ball that doesn't have your number on it, you pick it up with your foot or your racket. Um, tennis players are very familiar with this technique, so you don't have to touch it and you hit it back to them. And they do the same. And so the only ball that you touch is the one that you brought. So and of course, for the rest of it, you can stay quite far apart. They actually do talk a little bit about doubles and say, you know, either be careful or uh, um, play with your wife or, or don't do <laughs> either play with somebody in the same household or or don't do doubles. Um, and certainly none of the uh, uh, there's a doubles team that does uh, two guys who do a chest bump uh, whenever they win a point And they say, no, don't do that. I think somebody ought to do a test to see whether if you hit the ball hard enough, it will it will whack all the Can virus. Can you knock off. the virus off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They need to have they need to That's have right. um, they need to have Roger Federer get involved with this experiment and exactly have him do a couple right. of serves and see if he can. Or Roscoe Tanner would be even better, but <laughs> I have a suggestion that it would make it easier for them to see whose balls are whose. Just take a a, a red felt tip pen. And mark both sides of your balls so that no matter how they roll, you can always sell it. Well, the, um, the numbers on them, the numbers and brand names are easily visible as well. Yeah. Okay. So these uh, recommendations, uh, Alan put a link in, so yes. that can be in the show notes right. as well. Uh, just a few hours before we started, a, a article published in the Times, a group of 77 Nobel laureates has asked for an investigation into the cancellation of a federal grant to EcoHealth Alliance, mm. which we all know from uh, last week's TWIV. It's a group that does wildlife sampling of bats for coronaviruses in China. I really like what Harold Varma said. Yes. He called the cancellation an outrageous abuse of political power to control the way science works. Yeah. So, you know, we get hell for talking about politics. So Harold Varmus can do it for us. Yes. Well, and also this is this is politics meddling in the science, which should not be happening. There was also a letter, community sign-on letter started by the American Society for Biology and biochemistry and molecular biology, ASBMB, right. and that uh, a number of organiza organizations signed, including the American Society for Virology. So. so did you read what they wrote in Lancet? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. So this letter is being sent to uh, uh, both Anthony – oh, no, it's being sent, sent to the secretary of HHS – yeah. And to uh, Francis Collins, head of mm -hmm. the NIH. I don't, uh, which is entirely appropriate, I don't uh, be interested to see what the response is, put it that way. I don't know that they necessarily have, uh, they must have, some mechanisms in place to deal with. Well, actually, I don't know if they got anything in place. Yes, H HHS has, uh, I think it's an inspector general. They have somebody, they have an office that's responsible for investigating monkey business with grants and that kind of thing. That exists. Uh, however, the um, the head of HHS, like all cabinet level appointments, uh, is somebody picked by the president who is pretty much responsible for having canceled this grant in the first place. And so I don't think we're going to get a whole lot of traction from that. If enough, if enough members of Congress get involved and demand it, there are ways to start an independent oversight process that that could, right. you know, bring things to light that will be ignored, basically. Right. <laughs> Uh, and I don't know if there's any standing mechanism in the NIH itself to deal with this. After all, NI the the cancellation ultimately came from the NIH. Yes, but right? NIH is under HHS. Yeah. Okay. So, oh. there is the ombudsman office, also. Right. Mm -hmm. So Peter Dashak will return to TWIV in uh, a little over a week. Maybe we'll ask him about this. Do you think he'll talk about it? Oh, I mm. think he might. <laughs> we'll try. We'll see. I hope so. Oh, no, he'll, he'll talk. For a little lighter fare, uh, we have a letter from Rona who um, talks about her career, but 
the part I wanted to read, uh, she thanks us, of course, for keeping her inspired. Um, keep on being grumpy, making us smile and laugh. I have become grumpy too. Too many covid idiots. Yes. <laughs> A lot of them out there. All right. So yesterday, I was very pleased to see in the New York Times an article about my town of birth. Yes. Patterson, New Jersey, where I spent the first eight years of my life. As the nation begins virus tracing, it could learn from this New Jersey city. Patterson, a low-income city of 150,000, has been a pioneer in creating a contact tracing program to spread curb of the virus. And then just this morning, L'Oreal, our friend from the uh, Washington, Oregon, Oregon, maybe, sent the article as well. And um, she's Call hopeful. Washington. Thank you. We're at 56F. Yes. And uh, I met L'Oreal at a meeting. Now she's in industry. She said, I hope the Patterson uh, experience can inform other cities about how to do it. It's very interesting that, you know, this little kind of forgotten city has got someone who's doing it right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's great. And, you know, a lot of people complain, oh, we can't do contact tracing. We don't have the, the ability Sure you can. You can do anything. Yeah, that's true. Learn from that. Yeah, the, thing, the, the right way to do things is entirely possible, and there are people who know how to do it. The problem we have is that the people who know how to do it are not in the positions that we need them in to enforce this sort of thing nationwide. Yeah, that's right. I like the report um, in this where um, they're talking to the cab driver and – um, he asked who he came in contact with and they weren't, and they didn't tell him. They do a nice job of kind of talking about how you should follow those HIPAA guidelines here too. Right. Mm. Yeah, that's right. So I was w w curious about how New Jersey was doing overall. So I got a figure here. Looks pretty good actually. On daily cases and deaths by illness onset date. Uh, we've had 151,000 confirmed cases here. And yeah, it's gone up. It peaked somewhere in April, and now it's gone down. And this, by the way, uh, is a very good way to graph these data by illness onset date. Right. Because yeah. this mm -hmm. is the, – there's at least a two-week lag to all of this. And so That's and right. this graph shows it beautifully. You see – It does. Um, it does. In mid-March, when everything was getting locked down, cases are shooting up, and that's the onset date. People are catching it mid-March, and then – the, the number of people who catch it levels off by the beginning of April and starts coming down. And the onset dates later in April are coming down, showing that the, the lockdown mm -hmm. worked exactly the way it was supposed to and everything's trending in the right direction. So as a result, New Jersey is about to open on June 15th for non-essential businesses. We'll see how that goes. Well, a lot of states are are now doing that and I will, I'm, yeah, sure we'll, early, I'm sure we'll. Yeah, I'm sure early. we'll talk about that more as we as we answer more letters. But um, yeah, the, the word COVID <laughs> will appear in a lot. And of our well, and well. there's and there, governors are trying to balance difficult decisions here because there are there are real costs, real life costs to keeping everything closed. That uh, of course, sir. You know, um, it's not just about gosh, I want to get my hair cut. It's well. You know, people are are literally killing themselves because they're sitting home unemployed. Um, there's two other things about this graph I want to point out. One is that there's the um, the red tips on each curve tells you the number of deaths, and you can see the time lag that uh, we've mentioned. And so, at the end of the curve in May, most of the peaks don't have uh, red mm. tips on them, but every week there's a dip, and that is on Sunday. Yeah. So there are fewer illnesses, f fewer illness onsets on Sundays. Go figure. I was told by some other source that that's a reporting error, that that uh, they, the people who report these things report less on the weekends. And so you have to wait for the next. Yeah, and there's a, yeah. there's a spike every Monday that seems to be making right. up for that. Exactly. Right. Um, <laughs> so if you average those two for Saturday or for Sunday and Monday, it probably will. In fact, what's happening is a lot of people are getting sick on Sunday, but they don't get met to medical attention or they don't, the report doesn't get logged until Monday morning. Right. That's right. That's right. That's that right. was yeah. my point. Yeah. But it is very striking mm -hmm. how clearly you can see yes. the weeks on this mm -hmm. graph. 
Oh yeah, I mean, it look if you go to the Hopkins website, it looks like a set of mountain ranges. Every country has a different shaped set of mountain ranges, but uh, it it definitely has a regularity to it, except for a few. You know, there are a couple that don't have that regularity, and I, it, I'm wondering about their reporting uh, systems. So this uh, just yesterday, also a, a splash story in the New York Times on the work of. Jeff Shaman, who, of course, oh, yeah. was on TWIV weeks ago, and he has put out a, a Med Archive preprint, Differential Effects of Intervention Timing on COVID-19 Spread in the U.S. Senpei Sasikiran Kanjula and Jeff Shaman, of course, Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia. I swear, Rich, that when we talked to him, this was on his website already. Yeah, I think uh, so. Mm -hmm. But uh, since they just, I don't know, just put it up anyway, the Times captured it yesterday and have a graph of how earlier control measures could have saved lives. So reported deaths on May 3rd, 65,000. If, if distancing had started one week earlier than it did in March, would they estimate 29,000 deaths. And if two weeks earlier, 11,000 deaths. So it's a very striking wow. graph. Of course, built on a model, which is rather complicated. It's a dynamic metapopulation model informed by human mobility data and representing transmission of the virus in 3,142 counties. And they simulate both documented and undocumented infections for which they have separate transmission rates. And so they say, you know, how would this transmission go if we change the date of um, <clears throat> the lockdown and so forth? And so they, they come up with a bunch of numbers um, yeah, so these are, of course, non-pharmaceutical in interventions. So, Vincent, when do you th when do you think we're going to see the breakdown of the people who died by age, uh, ethnicity, underlying conditions, so that we get a clearer picture of who the susceptibles are? I think that's a great question because we got it very early on from China, if yeah. you remember. I do. Yeah, I do. Um, we haven't got it from the U.S. Nope. yet. No. I don't know. Yeah, it's because in the U.S. the data are scattered uh, scattered among differently formatted state websites and different ways of displaying the data and i think we're just about to talk to uh, talk about uh, what texas has done with that <laughs> anyway i wanted to point out that so they it's a model right. of course and all models are wrong and some are useful but um it's an interesting simulation uh, but they also look they use this to say that you know, we're going to have resurgences and we have to respond rapidly to them because every week we delay will cause quite a few more cases and deaths. So um, I think that's really, for me, the message is that we th there will be more infections and we have to be ready to deal with them. Yeah, Sweden is a good example, by the way, of a country which has only about 7% of its population that's infected. So there's absolutely no herd immunity there whatsoever. We're going to talk a lot about Sweden in a little bit. Yeah, I can see that. I, I actually looked ahead. <laughs> I heard Brienne start to talk. Oh, I, Sorry. I just wanted to say that um, I would agree that that is sort of the most important take-home message here. You know, I think that there are tweaks that you could make in different ways with the model. I'm not a modeler, so I, I can't totally speak to them. But the idea that, yes, we need to be uh, responding rapidly and the speed of our response is going to make a big difference in the number of uh, people who are affected is very much a take-home message that is clear from this study. But Brienne, I, we brought you on TWIV because you're a modeler. Yeah. <laughs> oh! <laughs> You, 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 you forgot right. to tell me that part. <laughs> should say you only work yeah. at clay. She's a model teacher and, and researcher. That was it. Oh, <laughs> oh, that model. part. Yeah. <laughs> I have now a question for Rich Condit. I just got this article uh, because the author, Madeline Meckelberg, I've talked to her a few times, and this is about Texas will stop combining coronavirus antibody and test data, antibody and PCR data. Why did they do that in the first place, Rich? Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, not in a frequent contact with the governor yeah. or the Texas health officials, so I can't give an authoritative answer to that question. However, um, I can tell you I pasted uh, in response to that a link to uh, an article in The Atlantic uh -huh. Dateline mm. yesterday, yep. 
uh, that is titled, How Could the CDC Make That Mistake? <laughs> this practice of combining the tests from uh, the antibody test, the serology test, and the PCR test for active virus is much more widespread than just Texas. That doesn't ex- uh, doesn't excuse Texas, uh, uh, but um, sure. uh, apparently, <laughs> apparently, I would like to, you know, I'd like to look into this. Well, we're going to hear a lot more about this, but um, the lead-in sentence to this is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is conflating the results of two different. Uh, types of coronavirus tests, distorting several important metrics and providing the country with an inaccurate picture of the state of the pandemic. And I just want to point later out on in the same that period. is a beautifully crafted sentence because the part after the comma answers the question of why are they doing the part before the comma. And uh, uh, the paragraph ends with that the agency confirmed to the Atlantic on Wednesday that it is mixing the results of viral and antibody tests, even though the two tests reveal different information. It goes on later on to say several states, including Pennsylvania, Texas, Georgia, and Vermont, are blending data in the same way. Virginia as well. Maine uh, has recently separated uh, it's data. It was combining them before, blah, blah, blah. So this is not, I mean, this is a, has been a fairly widespread practice. As you get into this article, it becomes a little more confusing as to what the history of data reporting at CDC has been and how they're dealing with it now. But I have to say that uh, uh, it's disturbing. Correct. Um, so, so the issue here is the tests as we have discussed in the past, measure different things. Uh, the PCR test measures whether you is a, actually it's a proxy. It's looking for genome RNA, not active virus, but nevertheless, it's the best proxy we have for whether or not you have an ongoing virus infection. The serology test tests whether you were ever uh, infected in the past. So they, those are very different things. Uh, that uh, are have very different uses, and if you combine those data and say and and basically equate the that serology positive is the same as PCR positive, you know I think basically you lose the meaning of yes. either test. Correct. It becomes yes. meaningless. I just okay? I just want to float something, and that is that. If you want to just be able to report the total number of tests yes. that are being done, yes. you right. would yes. combine them. And sure. there may be yes. pressure yes. or a willful thing by the very tippy top leadership of the CDC to do yes. that. Yes. So there are two yes. there are two things this accomplishes that some people would consider good. The first is that it gives the highest possible number of tests performed. And the second is, as Rich just said, it makes it impossible to figure out exactly how bad things are. Right. So the day before yesterday, Fort Lee offered free testing, both for PCR and for serology. And the PCR test that they were offering was the one developed at Rutgers University, where you spit into a tube and then shake it with a fluid, a blue-colored fluid. I guess that preserves the virus so that they can do the PCR test. But the people who were administering these two tests, and they were all done for free, by the way, s- clearly made us understand that the PC, the test that you spit into tells you whether you have the virus. And the test that you hold your arm out and they let you, you let them take blood, that's the test that tells you whether you've ever had this before. And those people that were administering this test, both of them, were clear on that, and they explained it to virtually Good. everybody who took the test. Oh, that's so you good. went, Dixon? You well, went in? I did. Of course I did. And I was, I was negative for the PCR test because that was done very quickly. The serology will take longer. Hmm. My wife and I are both negative for the PCR test. Well, that's what you saying. <laughs> <laughs> I was then. That, that might be now. I think but it's that was like, then. That's right. <laughs> that's the test that we talked about being inaccurate a few weeks ago. The spit anyway, test? That's good that they're doing. No, not spit. Just the quick that, rap, PCR that quick test. PCR, you know, 15-minute PCR. 
Yeah. So I'm sure I'm sure that we will uh, hear more about this. This is just uh, basically breaking now. Uh, this is one of the things that makes me thankful for an independent news media. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, I find it. You know, I'm going to uh, try. I'm going to do my best to withhold judgment until I see more reporting on this. But I have to say that the notion that this kind of thing is coming out of the CDC is uh, unnerving, yes. to say the least. Mm -hmm. When I first read about this yesterday, it was sort of like my head hurt for a long time, and I, I couldn't quite wrap my head around what in the world was going on. There was a bunch of comments that they collected from for the from the people who had permanent jobs at the CDC as to what they thought was happening. And they all said that the brass of CDC is not basing their decisions on the science that the people below them were collecting and making available. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a serious breach of the charter of the Centers for Disease Control. I think that's a suable offense. As somebody who's followed the CDC for over 20 years as a journalist and and you know, I've talked to people there. I know their their record and what kind of an agency they are. And I'm just I'm just depressed about the whole situation because I mean, this is yeah. this is it, the premier epidemic investigation and public health organization in the world. They are amazing. The people there and what's being done to it, it is just it's unconscionable. Yeah, I, with so many of my students, that's kind of what they aspire to. Yeah, they should. When they talk about what they would love to do with their biology yeah. degree. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think this is all going to change soon. I hope so. I sure hope so, Dixon. That's that's why I, I want to sure be known so. as happy. Yes. There's a uh, <laughs> very good quote by Ashish Jha, who's a professor of global yeah. health at Harvard. And this is a good uh, to explain why it's not a good idea to do this. He says, because antibody tests are meant to be used on the general population, not just symptomatic people. They will, in most cases, have a lower percent positive rate than viral tests. So blending viral and antibody tests will drive down your positive rate in a very dramatic way. Oh, yeah. that's and true. So that may be another goal to say, hey, we have fewer positive people. Well, this is right up there with the uh – uh, issue that we just uh, finished discussing about uh, the NIH grant yeah, uh, that's right. being that's uh, yes. nuked. Okay, it's all symptomatic. Um, it's uh, science being manipulated. All symptomatic uh, for uh -huh. whatever reason. Rich, uh, if you go back in history and look at Lysenko's of influence on the Russians' agriculture programs, it's not different than than it is now because politicians listen to who they want to listen to and they don't listen to people that they don't trust. If, if, politicians, if, if a yeah. scientific, if a scientist comes out and says something that goes against the grain of the politician, that scientist is dead meat under certain regimes. It's basically, it's basically an attempt to fabricate reality yeah, that's right. rather than dealing with reality here, here. as it you is. Might even right. call it, you might and even call it the development of alternative facts. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Institute for the Development of Alternative yes. Facts. Okay. Um, more, more to come. <laughs> yes. I, wa I wanted to point out a cool article in the Columbia Journalism Review written by Lauren Harris. I've been speaking with Lauren for the past few weeks and she wrote this article called The Pandemic and the Information Network. And she had told me originally, it's not about so much the science, but how we got the information together. And it is so nicely written. And I tell you, she's talked to me and a bunch of other people for hours. And I don't know how she distilled it all into this amazingly focused and compelling and cool article. But, man, that's why she's a writer. That's how you get trained to do it. That's a great school, but, by the way. Uh, Oh, man, it's so good. And it, it, it recounts the early time, the first time on Twiv. L listen to this. 8,000 miles away in New York City, uh, you know, we did our first Twiv. And um, she says, on January 12th, we recorded episode 582. This little virus went to Mark. <laughs> yep. And she talks, she, she listened to the episode and quotes from it. Anyway, 
I think this is just wonderful writing. And mm-hmm. I re- take a look at it. It's so good. <laughs> Great shirt you're wearing like- in front of the green screen, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a perfect contrast, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And I like what she says about you. Rack and Yellow, a virologist described by some as passionate and by others as ranty, wrote and teaches, <laughs> works and teaches at Columbia University. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ranty and grumpy. You're both no. of those. No, you're passionate. 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 You're passionate. passionate. Period. Okay. I'm, I'm becoming less offended by things as time goes on. Well, there's so much Actually, to be offended ranty, by. How could you ref- how could you react to all I of think, it? <laughs> I think ranty and passionate are fine. I don't even mind grumpy. That's okay. Because I, frankly, as I said to someone, someone texted me and had read this independently. And I said, yeah, I, I am both. I can't deny it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so read the, it out. Read really the quote, good. Kathy. Read the quote that uh, hangs on his she wall. She did. Oh, oh, and I've never seen it there. Anyway, um, he, Vincent has a poster on the wall that reads, there is no expedient to which a man will not resort to avoid the real labor of thinking. Right. And who said that? I believe that. Uh, Thomas Edison. Really? <laughs> no, actually, it wasn't Thomas Edison. It was Joshua Reynolds. Oh. And Thomas Edison had it on his wall ah. in his laboratory. And in fact, I went to visit his lab ages ago when I was in high school in Edison, New Jersey, and I bought the poster because I loved it. And um, it's just so true because... I think I need to show that to my students. That's <laughs> <Yeah>, good. <laughs> right. And remember, tell yeah. them man is generic in this case. <laughs> yeah. Brianne, they will look at you and wonder what the heck you're thinking. Yeah, they do that all the time anyway. <laughs> Next time you're there, Vincent, changing the CO2 or nitrogen tanks, you should take a picture of that poster for us. Absolutely. we Will do. we Will do. Kathy, you have a bunch of cool links here. Yeah. So there was a story in the Michigan University of Michigan news we got this week about uh, helmets for patients to wear. And it was developed by some ER docs in conjunction with University of Michigan Engineering. So it was a, a UM Engineering YouTube video. And then science picked it up. So uh, there's two items, a helmet and a tent. And they're both for the patient. And so... This, uh, the clinicians and the engineers got together and the engineer, Sridhar Kota, uh, kind of went around and was looking for some kind of industrial helmet. He ordered it. He went and picked it up and he attached it to a small handheld vacuum cleaner. Um, and then they've kind of tweaked it, but basically you put this on the patient. It, it's almost like a papper, you know, for the patient and, and then. Um, you use the vacuum cleaner that has some kind of filter in it and you can reduce the aerosol spread from uh, around the patient. And then there's a mm. larger device that's a tent. And so both of these have been written up in the International Journal of Tuberculosis and Lung Disease as uh, preprints. And they're consolidated by some organization that's uh, consolidating these called the union.org. So the links are there. Um, one a uh, person did point out uh, another emergency room physician that didn't do the work, wasn't involved with it, said the tests don't prove that these devices are going to work in real life, you know, in the in the clinic. But uh, if it's independently validated, it would be really great. They estimate the cost of these would be $150. They would need FDA approval. And they estimate that they could have these out by fall of 2020. And at the moment, uh, Sridhar Kota said he's trying to get somebody to buy up all the existing stock of these, maybe the government or somebody to start uh, making these adjustments and conversions and things. Mm. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm. On Friday morning, I I get a newsletter from ASM News and the first three or four things in it are always uh, the different TWIV episodes that have been put out. Um, but if you go down there, they're con- kind of consolidating uh, news items. And one of them uh, was a, a nice uh, kind of lay person's article about an article that Kanta Subarao uh, published in Cell Host and Microbe, kind of a, uh, it's not called opinion, it's called something else. But anyway, um, it's a cool article where she describes what we've learned from the SARS coronavirus vaccine efforts. So SARS-1 coronavirus uh, vaccine efforts. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, a new song recalls an, ol- recalls an old melody. 
Um, and she has several different things. Neutralizing antibody protects from infection in animals. Again, this is all based on SARS-1 efforts. Vaccines that induce neutralizing antibodies protect animals from challenge. And then she has a summary of the two SARS vaccines that were ident- evaluated in human phase one clinical trials. One was an inactivated whole virus vaccine, and it was well tolerated. It re- resulted in zero conversion in 85% of vaccinees. Um, and frequency of zero conversion improved after the second dose. The other vaccine was a SARS recombinant plasmid DNA vaccine encoding the SARS uh, spike glycoprotein. And there were some mild uh, injection symptoms, but no serious adverse events reported. Um, they did find uh, spike protein specific ELISA antibody responses. However, neutralizing antibodies were not detected in an infectious virus assay. They reported CD4 T cell and CD8 T cell responses. The CD4 uh, were detected in all 10 subjects and CD8 in only two of 10 subjects. And then neither of these uh, were tested further because SARS did not reemerge, as we have said before, and could be a problem, you know, if we want to get a lot of numbers, a high N for any of the kinds of things that are going to be tested, there has to be enough infection going on to uh, make it relevant. One of the cool things that she told about that I never knew was that they were uh, working with a hamster model and in a creative approach to demonstrate that these are affected, (laughs) they put the hamsters on wheels and had a way to digitally collect the data overnight and measured the average number of revolutions before and after they got the virus. And after they got the virus, it uh, the revolutions decreased by tenfold or more. Yeah, the baseline, so, the baseline activity level for hamsters is apparently 700 to 1,000 wheel revolutions per hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah. then it goes down. Do they have these little it, hand clickers. It, it goes, they, no, no, they had yeah. a little LCD counting wheel revolutions. It goes down an order of magnitude after infection with SARS. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so um, then the last section is um, – what studies can be done now in the midst of the pandemic that will be valuable for vaccine development. And so she points out that first, the neutralizing antibody response in recovered patients should be characterized, including the average titers after asymptomatic, mild and severe disease, titers in different age groups, kinetics, longevity of neutralizing antibody, and so on. And second, to undertake uh, studies in animal models to define a protective neutralizing antibody titer using human sera from recovered patients with a range of titers and putting uh, pre-administering that to SARS-2 animal models and then following by challenge infections. And the ability of human serum of a specific titer to prevent productive infection would uh, help identify target titers for vaccines. So I hadn't heard that aspect of it before, but it's, uh, I thought a really good way of describing it. So it's just a short, it's called a forum. That's what it is in cell host and micro. And it's open access. Right. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, really nice. I want to point out one aspect. She's talking about animal models for SARS-CoV-2. And she says, um, you know, most of the animal models, uh, ACE2 expressing mice, hamsters, ferrets, non-human primates, clinical signs of a disease are absent or mild and she says, reliance on radiographic changes in infected animals as the main measure of vaccine efficacy is not ideal. <laughs> yes. Putting it mildly, right? Yes. That's great. So did any of you see the um, papers that came out in Science on Wednesday talking about animal models and vaccines? Yeah. Um, so there were, there were two different papers that um, came out uh, on Wednesday um, online in Science, um, both from the same lab. Um, one was called uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection protects against rechallenge in rhesus macaques. Um, and so um, the uh, macaques were infected and then rechallenged, and it seemed as though they did make um, immune responses that um, were protective and that, you know, so that's sort of positive for um these questions of reinfection and whether protective immune responses occur. And there was a second 
paper from the same group um, showing uh, DNA vaccines could also lead to protection. Were these two uh, groups from China? No, these are both um, from Dan Baruch's lab at Harvard. Oh, right, right. So the China paper we, we covered about a month ago with the same thing with non-human primates uh, protected, right? Yes. Yep. And I remember, I think, I just don't remember what kind of vaccine they were using in that other study. Uh, right. Anything else, Kathy? Does that do it? I think that does it. Well, there were Good. several other things. Once you click on that link for uh, Kanta's paper, then there's another lay summary about a human monoclonal antibody that blocks SARS-2 infection that I hadn't seen about uh, seen. I don't know if we've talked about it. Maybe not yet. Um, so. So unless we're going to talk about this later, which I didn't see any letters about the Kawasaki-like syndrome that's affecting children right now is being addressed by clinicians using combined pooled IgG from normal people. That just, it, it looks like it's not a, 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 a specific therapy. It's one which convinces the body that it's done enough job with its IgG against all that stuff. Stop doing that. And that shuts it down. Hmm. Yeah, Daniel told us this two weeks ago when he said he's using yeah, IgG for this, and we talked a little bit about what's going on. Okay, uh, let's do some email. The first email is from Maria Isabel, who's writing from Planet Phage, the gateway to bacteriology. She wants to share her project with us. She's a PhD student at the Rower Lab at SDSU, San Diego State University. We are looking for volunteers to swab the surfaces of their homes in San Diego County and send them to us to perform RT, qPCR, LAMP, metagenomics, and metatranscriptomics. And she has a link to the project there. Please help us spread the word, share the link where people can apply to get a kit sample in their homes. So we will put this link, and you can, if you're in San Diego County. And you're one of the and, first thousand. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe full already, right? Who knows? Yeah. All right, Rich, you're next. Uh, where are we? No, Norm. Was, uh, Norm. Norm. <laughs> you got Norm. I love to surprise people. <laughs> right. I'm doing. Uh, you have to I'm read this with a certain tone in your voice, yes. by the way. <laughs> I'm doing research in the background. Okay, Norm writes. We are not going to eliminate this virus. Get over it. Billions of people have been exposed. You will have to stop any of them from coming to the U.S. and U.S. citizens never leaving their country for years. Are you guys okay with that? <laughs> yeah. Am I, am I doing <laughs> that's, this right? That's good. You're, you're, you're doing really good. Really good. <laughs> Yesterday, New York had 3,000 cases. How in the world are you going – Are you, uh, how in the world are you going to identify everyone these people were in contact with for the last 14 days and then trace them? What if they forget? What if they don't <laughs> want to tell you? What if they rode a subway? What if they don't know the people they were close to? Yeah. What if the people you isolate don't want to stay isolated, like, say, Neil Ferguson? <laughs> who, who are you going to test, trace, and isolate how are you going to test, trace, and isolate people who do not come into the country legally? You're living in a fantasy world. We will all be Sweden, whether we want to or not. Okay, so this is actually, I think, a really good topic. Yes. And a really good letter. Um, so the first, uh, the first thing I want to deal with here is this statement, we are not going to eliminate this virus. Okay, because I think that's an important statement. And frankly, I agree with it. Mm -hmm. We don't know for sure, but I agree with that statement. And and I'm I've been trying to, right? No. no. Well, well, but I think there's a misconception, okay, in the public mind, because uh people are always looking at these uh curves and the uh, disease decreasing and that kind of and when can we open up and that kind of stuff. And I I'm suspicious that in the minds of some, uh, they're thinking that if you can get it down to the point where there are no infections and there is no disease, that the virus is gone. Right. Right. And that's not true. Right. Okay. Exactly. As, as I understand it, the virus is going to be everywhere. And so 
when, and it's also absolutely clear to me, at least, that all of these social distancing things do have a significant impact on the disease burden and how the virus spreads. Yes. And so as you lift those restrictions, there's going to be disease coming back. Correct. And uh, uh, I still go back to the conversation we had with Ralph weeks ago or you know, whatever, you know, what? a long time ago, um, that absent a vaccine, and that's the big unknown here, absent a vaccine, this isn't really going to be over until the virus has spread through the population and you get some brand of herd immunity. Now, uh, we've discussed recently that uh, that's a squishy term, hu herd immunity, but I don't think it's all that squishy. I think it really impacts on the situation here. So, um, to me, the question is, uh, has always been since the beginning when we started talking about flattening the curve, somehow finding the middle ground between the devastation to public health and the devastation to the economy to try and walk this tightrope through this, okay, and coexist in a way with this virus as it comes to equilibrium with us in a fashion that on the one hand doesn't cause excess mortality because we're not dealing with the health crisis adequately, and on the other hand doesn't cause excess economic uh, uh, damage at the same time. Okay. So I don't disagree with what he's saying. Test, trace, isolate to the extent that you can is part of the way to find, to walk that tightrope. Yeah. I see. To find our way through this. I see test, trace, and isolate as being critical to any kind of reopening that we do because really this whole thing, the social distancing, the the lock everything down phase, and now the test, trace, and isolate was, the, the point of locking everything down was so we could set up to test, trace, and isolate. Because yes. we were not set up to do that. Plus, we didn't know what was going on, And right? we didn't know what was going on. So, okay, just, just nobody go out, and that will buy us some time. Yes. We can figure out what's going on so that we can set up a tracing and isolation system that we know we need. And that, in turn, combined with continuations of many aspects of the lockdown, but maybe we can open some things as we get a better grip on things, um, that is also just stalling to buy us time until we have a vaccine. Because that is ultimately the only answer that's going to get us to anything like what we used to consider normal. The, the thing I have a problem with with Norm here is that he's saying because there's so many cases in New York, you can't trace, test, trace, and isolate. But that's, that's not, not what true. we point. That's not the point. The point is once the cases are very low and people start going back to work, and New York has not yet, you have fewer than 3,000, and then you can you can do the the Tetris with those. Mm -hmm. That's the point. You don't do it, of course, not when there are thousands and thousands of people. It's impossible. But when you have few cases and then you do that when you want to start the next outbreak, that's the point, Norm. And and you can actually, you can trace, it, it is possible to trace contacts for, uh, if you put enough people on the job, you could trace 3,000 cases. But it, it, a reasonable caseload, you could you could trace all of them and no, you're not going to find every single contact, Right, but it's not spreading through somebody walking past somebody on the street. It's spreading through closer contacts that are traceable and you will be able to trace most of them. And that's what we need to be able to do to limit spread and continue to buy time. I think what Norm is getting at is, is that we should just we should just just do this chicken pox party approach and and throw all the old people under the bus because that's just the cost of doing business. Um, I don't know if that's quite what he was arguing, but that's the net effect that would have is if we let this thing run rampant through the population, we are going to have a lot of deaths. We can save a lot of lives by doing these types of measures that will keep it tamped down until we have a lasting solution, which will be a vaccine. Right. And these, these solutions um, may not be perfect. 
Right. But they are going to make a difference and they are going to really help. Right. You yes. know, we know that public health measures can be very helpful um, because and just because they're not perfect, that doesn't isn't a reason to throw them out entirely. Look, right. if we could just concentrate our efforts on nursing homes, for instance, we could have cut the death rate in half. And that's a simple thing to do. Well, it's, it's simple, but it's, it's, it's simple, expensive. it's simple, but not easy. It's yeah, simple it's expensive expensive. and difficult. That's but right. It's, but it's, yeah. look at how much it would have been worth it, though. I mean, if yeah. we had done that. Some did that. There was a guy, I don't know if you saw this or not, but there was a, a former Marine who's in charge of a nursing home now. And uh, I did somewhere see. locally in the New York metropolitan area. And um, he said, as soon as we heard about this, he says, everybody who works here started to live in the facility. And no one could go out until we thought we knew what was going on. They didn't have a single death, not one death. And that cost more money to keep the people inside the facility with the nursing care people, uh, the older people. But nonetheless, the whole thing worked, of course, because you were stopping traffic. Okay, let's move on. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Joel um, writes, there was a Harvard study that surveyed public opinion on mandatory childhood vaccines. Only 54% of adults thought vaccines were very safe, and only 37% reported a trust in public health agencies. The survey questions methodologies are listed in the press release uh, that he linked to. Um, this was concerning to me with this virus, because, uh, because with this virus requiring a fairly high percentage to reach herd immunity, any sizable portion of people refusing the vaccine could be very dangerous for the rest of us. Do you all have opinions on this topic? Oh, boy. Is, this, is it even <laughs> a real concern when faced with a pandemic? If it gets down to it, could the U.S. be able to implement a mandatory adult vaccine without riots? Uh, okay, so it is true that a lot of people have have varying views about vaccines and that's because of all the disinformation that's been put out there by the anti-vaccine movement. Um, but I am pretty sure that under the current circumstances, this is not a case where you're asking the general public, what do you think in general about vaccines? This is, do you want a vaccine against the pandemic virus that has shut down the entire global economy and killed you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Right. I think the overwhelm. I don't have the poll data on this, but I will bet somebody the price of a beer that the the poll data would show overwhelming support for people saying yes, they would get this vaccine. If sure, there, absolutely. You know, if there's an effective vaccine against this, the line is going to go around many blocks. Yeah. So if you look at the link that he sent, um, the poll was done between August 6th and September 1st, 2019. Hey. Um, yeah. So before this <laughs> whole pandemic. Uh, so I really wonder what would happen if they did this exact same thing now. The thing, yeah. that, I, the thing that I'm also amazed at is that every year the flu vaccine comes out, right? And a very large number of people take that vaccine. I mean, a yes. very large number. Yes. And there's no consequence health-wise, except good, of course, from having experienced the vaccine. So where are these anti-vaxxers getting all this crappy information from? Oh, oh gosh. No, no, I, I realize that that's an yeah, open we've, question, we've Alan. Talked about, we've talked about this rabbit hole before. But, but you can, a rhetorical question. You can, yes. Of course, but you can use the flu vaccine as a good example of something that almost, uh, well, a large portion of the population takes advantage of it. And the anti-vaccine folks will rail that it's a government conspiracy to control your mind. Ni that's nice. That's nice. Uh, sorry. It just <laughs> that's, let them say whatever they want. I well, think everybody's a Christian in a foxhole during war. When this yes. when this vaccine comes out, these people are going to get that vaccine. I guarantee you. We we uh, already have had one person at least write in saying she will not take this vaccine. Right. So yes, yes good luck there are suffer. others out Those there. Those people will suffer. There are others out there, and um, uh, you know, I think it is an issue. But I, I think we'll they see. are going to be a much lower percentage of the population than we would need to worry about for establishing herd immunity. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I hopefully, hopefully, I do hope so. I, I think it also depends on how safe the vaccine is, oh, how, yeah, how well tested it is, and so forth. So that's why it has to be tested carefully. Brian, can you take uh, the next one, please? Sure. Matt writes. Um, this article in Wired suggests that SARS-CoV-2 might invade the brain. Um, and 
He also links to an article. Uh, this article in Trends in Neuroscience suggests that other coronaviruses can infect the brain. I think this would be very rare indeed, given that we aren't hearing much, if anything, about COVID encephalitis or virus, as opposed to RNA litter in the CSF. It worries me that if overstated, that if overstated by the media, this sort of story might make people too fearful when actually the risks are very low for most. And a former virologist. Uh, I don't think you could ever be a former virologist. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that, um, you know, we have talked about the idea of people losing their sense of smell, um, which might talk about or might be related to infections in nervous tissue. Um, but I'm not quite sure about invading the brain itself. Yeah, I think a lot of the neurological symptoms are could be cytokine based, right, Brian? Yes, absolutely. So, and these I, uh, uh, these articles, I had a look at these. These are uh, speculative. Even the Cell article is a is basically an opinion piece that says that says you know there there can be there may be neurological symptoms. Uh, but they could be a result of uh, e either a direct or an indirect result, and we really don't know mm -hmm. what's going on. Yeah. I think Matt's point is, uh, could this be uh, misinterpreted and misused by the media and cause unnecessary stress uh, in the public? And yeah. <laughs> yes. I, uh, I hope that that does not happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm looking at the Trends in Neurosciences paper right now, and, and they – cite some of the human common cold coronaviruses, one that's been associated with fatal encephalitis in children, um, and then SARS-CoV-2 RNA and CSF of a patient. That would That's SARS-1. And uh, uh, there's at least two of the different human common cold coronaviruses found in CSF of Parkinson's patients. And I remember um, asking Stanley Perlman and I, a couple weeks ago or a couple episodes ago, somebody said, you know, are there, is it uh, neurological or, or were the previous ones, were there some, was there some evidence of that? And I thought Stanley's answer had been yes. But again, this is so far associated, for instance, with fatal encephalitis. That doesn't mean causality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is possible. I think is about all we can say. And I'm not too worked up about media coverage of stuff like this. I think, um, you know, there's uh, pretty much all the news media are 24 seven COVID-19 coverage right now, as you've seen. So any story about it gets picked up and reported. And, you know, if somebody sees a story about this, who would have been cocky about it and said, ah, I'm young and healthy, I'm not at risk. And then they see, whoa, hey, it can maybe maybe infect the brain and maybe even young people could be at risk. And then they change their behavior on that basis. The, I don't think that's a bad outcome. Um, I do think that we shouldn't be going off about stuff like this to scare people. Um, but I, I'm not too concerned about... Um, speculation like this being picked up as long as it is adequately tagged as speculation. Yeah. Further the problem. <laughs> further in this trends in neurosciences, they have a nice roadmap for how research should be done about the impact of SARS-CoV-2 in neurological things. Um, uh, conduct detailed cognitive testing, um, uh, investigate CSF samples, for viral antigen sure. RNA, inflammatory mediators, and so forth. So scientists will be looking at this, but so far there's there's uh, a bunch of outstanding questions that they also list. Right. So not an easy question. We work on a virus, Entrovirus 68, that actually paralyzes kids. It's paralyzed over 600 kids in the US alone, and we can't find the virus in the CSF. Never. So not an easy thing to do. The the this Wired article I do not like the headline: "How Coronavirus Destroys the Human Body One Organ at a Time." I am sorry, <laughs> this is incorrect. And then Alan, someone who doesn't really know, will read this and freak out. And and uh, hopefully they'll write a letter to us and ask us to explain it. <laughs> yes, I I do. I, I want to clarify that I, I'm not in favor of sensationalist reporting like this Wired article. Um, that. 
Got it. That really is is over the top. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I think it's fine for scientists to point out that there there are aspects of this virus that still need to be studied. This is one of them. Um, and if people get the idea that, you know, maybe there's more to this virus than just a cough, then that's OK, because uh, maybe there is. <laughs> and we ought to keep that in mind. Yeah, there certainly is for, for sure. Um, Dixon, can you take the next Ken one? Michael writes. My question is related to the ACE2 increase from cigarette smoke. I guess he means it is ACE2 inducible by people who smoke. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Last, Would this last also two. pertain to smoke or other airborne irritants, for example, industrial pollution, long-term exposure to wildfire smoke as well? Good question. So interestingly, we talked about this on the last TWIV. Uh, cigarette smoke induces ACE2 mRNA. And they found also that inflammatory insults. Right. So I would think that, yeah, if you're inhaling a lot of mm -hmm. wildfire smoke, it's going to do similar things. Yeah. Or, or sprays in the environment that you might want to have happen to eliminate or yes. contaminate from the virus. Yes. Good point. Yes. <laughs> now, I must say the, uh, the, the paper that we th talked about last time was dealing with chronic smoke exposure, right? It right. might be given given to cigarette smoke for a year or people who smoke 80 packs a year or something like that. So I don't know if it's transient, but if you're working in uh, the outdoors and you breathe smoke every day, that's chronic exposure. Or secondhand right? smoke from smokers inside your house. But I do want to point out that just because ACE2 goes up does not mean that is what causes more serious COVID-19, right? Right. We, that final connection hasn't been made. It's an interesting observation for sure. And it is true. Certainly cigarette smoking does a whole bunch of bad things to your lungs. And COVID-19 is very much a lung disease. And so those are those are things you don't want to combine. And, and uh, chronic exposure to other airborne irritants has some similar effects. So this is the, a reasonable line of thinking. I'm not sure what you do with this information except quit smoking and try to try to avoid contact with environmental smoke and pollution. The data in China was pretty clear cut that more men than women were catching it and the men that were catching it were cigarette smokers, but that data didn't shake out in other places, I don't think. And yeah. I I don't know, I, I it's been a number of years since I was in China, but my experience there was that everybody smoked everywhere. They do, was, they do, they do. Right? You know, yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know that smoking was related to that. And that and that male female skew has been has been seen elsewhere. So we're not sure what's going on with that. Well, we will have Sabra Klein on in a couple of weeks to talk about uh, sex differences Great. in infectious disease susceptibility. That's awesome. She Her talks are always so good. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She said she's very excited to come on to TWIV. So, Kathy, can you take Philip? Sure. Philip writes, I'm in Kyoto where it's about 25C. I think that's about 77F, but I don't know for sure. It's actually 77 Fahrenheit. Uh, I have a family in Canada and in Sweden and friends in the US. Our experiences of the outbreak have been quite dramatically different. Professor Yamanaka from Kyoto University mentioned on NHK that BCG, the old vaccine against tuberculosis, might be a factor X that is reducing the impact of COVID-19. I had heard about this a few weeks ago, but people said it was too early in the outbreak to tell, and it was just a correlation, but it seems to be holding even now. BCG vaccination coverage in Japan is greater than 99% of the population. Other parts of Asia and India and Africa have some levels of BCG vaccination, and there seems to be lower impact of the outbreak. South Korea and Taiwan have longstanding BCG programs as well. China has BCG, but had a break during the Cultural Revolution. It appears that if older citizens have received BCG, that is to say that the BCG program is longstanding, the severity of the outbreak is reduced quite dramatically, as in Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and Singapore. This is just a correlation, but it appears to be a strong one. My understanding is that there are 12 studies focusing on BCG and COVID underway now, and they are focused on healthcare providers who have never previously received BCG, and it gives a link. I wanted to ask if there is a way to study people who have received BCG and recover from COVID-19 to see if there is some difference in their body's immune responses as compared to BCG negative patients who have recovered. That is, 
are there some telltale indications that the BCG positive patients had a different or more robust response to the infection? And then I uh, give some background on the experience of the outbreak in Japan. The approach has been to detect outbreak clusters and trace and isolate and quarantine the contacts. <laughs> but hardly any testing outside of this was done, outside of outbreak clusters. We are now down to less than 50 new cases per day for the whole country. In giant cities like Osaka, new cases are down to zero each day. This is all in Japanese, but please trust me. And he gives a link. The standard for ending the emergency situation in Tokyo is to have less than 0.5 new cases per 100,000 population for a week, which I think they will reach soon. You know, um, Brianne, isn't the BCG effect, wouldn't that just be transient? So you would not expect older people who got it years ago to actually be protected from it. Yeah. By, so, right? so I have, you know, kind of been hearing kind of these two BCG stories, one that makes it seem like it's a transient effect. And I think that the data is pretty good there. Um, I have not really understood the sort of long-term BCG effect, like he's talking about here, where older people might be protected when if they had been uh, vaccinated as kids. And I think that that data holds up um, in some countries, but not necessarily in others. Um, and if you look at the timing of when BCG was stopped in certain countries um, and the groups of people who are getting sick, it doesn't hold up. I was just trying to Google to find to remember the details of that study and I'm having trouble finding it. Um, but I feel like I've I've seen that before. Um, the, the data that I understand the best um, talks about BCG being a transient effect. Absolutely. Um, I suppose that he asks, you know, whether somebody could be examined Um someone who's BCG positive to see if their immune response is different. And um, people certainly could do uh, those types of studies um, to try to figure out if there was some difference, um, but it would be hard to um, get rid of all the other variables that might be hmm. there. Yeah. And speaking of other variables, I mean, this, this um, comparison of the correlations in South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, with other places and saying, well, those countries have BCG and countries without BCG are doing worse. It reminds me a little of that Facebook meme that had the masks, no masks circled and just flattened all the nuances of why South mm -hmm. Korea and other, you know, Taiwan and, and other countries in Asia were managing to control their outbreak. Um, I think the real story there is actually in the second part of the letter with the test, trace and isolate campaign that in well-run countries was done very aggressively, very early in the outbreak. And I think that is a much, much bigger secret to success here than BCG vaccination. Now, um, mm. the reason I say that is, first of all, BCG has been universal in China for a very long time. There was, uh, as, as stated here, there was a, a brief break in the Cultural Revolution, but that was 40 years ago. Um, so pretty much everybody walking around in China has gotten BCG and that didn't stop the virus from spreading wildly in places like Wuhan. Uh, and then if you're looking at places like India and sub-Saharan Africa, they're actually dealing with very serious outbreaks right now. Although it doesn't necessarily show that way because testing is so limited. But if you look at a city like Mumbai, um, it's not going well. And I, and I don't, think I, I think this comparison of BCG across countries is going to have to be a an apples and apples comparison and we just don't have the data for that yet yeah I agree completely I always worry um, when I hear people talk about certain countries that use BCG um, as having relatively few cases um, and whether or not that's just a lack of testing or lack of healthcare capacity. Um, in those or, or other factors um, so, like, you know, yes, South Korea has BC, uh, vaccinates with BCG. That's I think that has nothing to do with how they were able to control this outbreak. I think it was much more about the fact that they were right. on top of it from the beginning. Well, as Philip said, there are 12 uh, trials ongoing. Yeah. In oh, no, I think workers. it's uh, uh, we'll yeah. See. All that said, I think it's we'll totally see. appropriate to look at BCG immunology as a general phenomenon. And and we do know from. As Brianne said, from uh, studies that have already been done all with BCG, but also I think with studies that have been done with other vaccines, um, 
there's often a kind of a transient boost to immunity to all kinds of things after you get a certain vaccines. So there may be something to that that perhaps could be replicated with a with a more general purpose vaccine that doesn't have some of the downsides of something like BCG. Yeah, absolutely. As much as I am somewhat skeptical of this sort of long term protection, um, I think the short term protection is right. really interesting. All right. Rich uh, writes about block testing. So you pool samples and you test it all at once. And if a block is positive, then you go back and he wants to know, is this reliable? Can it be one of the ways to massively increase testing capacity? I've not heard of this at all. I think it's a bad idea. Uh, I think you might as well go through and do every one because you have enough problems with false positives and negatives. Can you imagine if you blocked 100 people together and it was negative, but there, in there was a, was a person who was positive? I don't know. Do, do we think this is a good idea? I wonder also, wouldn't you have a, a sensitivity issue? I mean, if you're yeah. – you know, Maybe you can crank up your assay, but if you're already going to be at the borderline of being able to determine something's positive by cycle thresholds, if you dilute it out with a bunch of other samples, it, you might miss things. Yes. Anyway, I haven't heard of it, so sorry we can't provide more. But then he changes um, his subject, wearing his mechanical engineering hat. I think the way the airflow AC aerosols were being thought of working was that the virus was traveling, circulating through the AC unit, meaning that HEPA filters would be of use. But I'm thinking that another mechanism is just by wind, right? The AC unit is moving air right. around, uh, so away from the infected, downwind to another. So any fan draft wind in a room full of people might increase transmission. And that makes perfect sure. sense yeah. for sure. So if you go to Costco and you go to the checkout line, and even oh. though you're standing six feet away from everybody else, that's where they put the fans. They're right above you. And you can feel the air coming down on you. I'm just thinking, oh, my God, I've got, the, I've got this entire Costco facility coming down on my head right now. <laughs> Costco is open? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Open. They sell food, man. Yeah, they sell store. food. Rich is a Brit living in Bali. Nice. Uh, so his last suggestion here is, would it be safer uh, where there was no wind draft or perhaps exhaust from the AC units could be fitted with diffusers to eliminate focused air movement, making it much more subtle? And that seems like a, a perfectly reasonable sure. Yeah, thing. it does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm baffled nobody suggested it. Oof. <laughs> oh, Jesus! Yeah, been a while. I know. I that, was yeah. <laughs> that was sitting in there for a yeah. while. I'd say. <laughs> Rich, you're next. John writes. I have a bone to pick. With you, you get all guys. the complainers now. It just I know going rich. I know. <laughs> this good. This is a good one too because uh, actually I was the one who uh, I'm, I'm the perp, and, and I case. was not on this episode. I uh, hasten to add. I have a bone to pick with you guys about your coverage of uh, Moderna. Oh no, 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 no! Actually, I'm thinking there's another bone to pick further on. This is not the this is not the one. At any rate, I have a bone to pick with you guys about your coverage of Moderna's decision uh, to issue its press release. For reasons not widely appreciated in academia, press uh, brief press releases of so-called top line data are a standard and necessary practice, not something that Moderna yes. has steamed up. So this is good. This is informative. Unlike academic researchers, publicly traded companies are ethically and legally bound to consider at what point withholding trial results becomes unfair to either new or existing shareholders, especially when issuing new shares, as Moderna is now doing. The $483 million the government is chipping in sounds like a lot until you consider that they are already ramping up in a hurry to manufacture a billion doses per year, all of them still subject to clinical risk. Furthermore, as you know, a full release may jeopardize the investigator's ability to publish the results or present them at academic conferences. Note that this uh, study, uh, the Moderna study, was conducted in collaboration with the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. The relevant legal issues are explained in the Security and Exchange Commission uh, exceptions to the embargo policy of the annual American Society of Clinical Oncology annual conference website 
with an exception for minimal top line data releases required to fulfill uh, SEC regulations. And he highlights uh, this need typically arises when there's a substantial likelihood that the information would be considered by a reasonable investor in the company to signify significantly alter the total mix of information made available to the investor. The information disclosed is the minimum necessary for such compliance. So professors shouldn't blame the corporate world for the brevity of press releases unless they're willing to forego giving presentations. I should also point out that the company gave a fascinating and still available one-hour public webcast to discuss the release, which included a Q&A from big investment companies. Later that day, there was another webcast from an investor conference, again, publicly available. Okay, so I'm actually, because I, I think Alan is probably tuned I, into this. I am, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry I wasn't on the episode where this came up, because I... It, it, it's, it's okay. <laughs> well, let, well, let well, just, wait a minute. Wait a me, minute. Wait. I complained about it, not because I said they made anything up or... It's a scheme. I just said, yes. I want to see the paper. Exactly. That's all I said. Exactly. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's exactly. all I said. And it, exactly. we, can, we can only, we could only speculate on some things because the data weren't yeah. all presented and we're scientists who are data driven. Okay. Right. That's all. I'm not really complaining about, I'm not really complaining about Moderna. Okay. It's just that it, as a scientist who wants to see all the data, it's frustrating to see little snippets of data. Oh I boy, do I feel your pain. Sure. Yeah. This comes up so yeah. often in my work where I'll get, cause I, I'm on email lists for this kind of thing where I'll, I'll get something that, oh wow, that looks interesting. And, and, oh, we can't show you the data because, oh God. You know, so I, of course, I'm not going to report on that because it's just a press release, but they are required to send this out for exactly the reasons outlined here, because if they didn't and somebody somehow got that information from the company and used it to trade, then that would be insider trading and the company could be culpable. And there's a whole thicket of regulations around all this. And and I don't think anybody considers this an ideal situation. But, yeah, that's it's frustrating to everybody. Right. So you can bet there's way more. So they went to the FDA and say, here's our phase one data. We want to do a phase two. And you can bet there was oh, way more data than they put in the press yeah. release. Oh, sure. Okay. So yeah. that's all I'm saying. Absolutely. I would like to see more. I'm not complaining. And I think they could, I mean, they could not tell us everything for sure. whatever reason. Al- although, but I, I right, understand but there are regulations that, about that too. So if they... Yeah, I mean, I if, understand. They, if they send out, if they cherry pick what they put in the press release and send that out, and it it uh, transpires later that in fact the data weren't so rosy, um, they're going to be in a heap of trouble. But that's not, yeah, that's still not letting us see the data, and I yeah. I totally get that. Right. right. Well, and you know, I did kind of speculate that they didn't tell us any. Uh, cell made immunity data. And I wondered whether that meant they didn't have any or whether it wasn't good. So I apologize for that speculation. Well, that's, well, that's, that's Alan, a, can you take a good the next point. One? That, those are the kinds of things that you can only get when you see the data. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Tom writes, I do wish um, you would make an effort to refrain from political comments in the podcast. When you bemoaned the fact that politics is encroaching on the science, I couldn't have agreed more. And yet within minutes, you were injecting politics into the discussion when you stated Mike Pompeo was lying when he said he had seen evidence indicating the virus may have escaped from a lab. Given you could not possibly know what information sources he has access to, uh, there's no way you could possibly know whether he was lying. You just don't have enough data to support, to support such a conclusion. As a scientist, I know you must agree. You obviously have a right to your political opinion, but when a science-based pod, but a science-based podcast is not the place for it. Your colleague on the podcast was correct when he said these things were best left for the cocktail hour. So uh, we, we were not being political. We were no. just doing science. Right. I think that part of what our mission is here is to prevent the spread of misinformation. And uh, when we see in misinformation, no matter where that, what the source is, we're going to call it out. Okay. And in this particular case, I don't think I would have to go back and listen to it. But now this may seem a subtle distinction, but I don't think we actually said Mike Pompeo is lying. I think we quoted what he said. There is a, which is, quote, 
There is a significant amount of evidence that this came from that laboratory in Wuhan. End quote. And uh, that is untrue. That that is not believable. Right. It's not believable. Now, you know, so that to me is misinformation. Yeah, you can say, well, maybe he's got evidence that we don't have baloney. Okay. We've been through this so many times. There's no way that came out of that laboratory. Right. I, okay? I think that, you know, while um, Tom is right that I, I do not have access to all of the information that Mike Pompeo has. Um, when I do an analysis of the evidence that is out there, I come to a very strong conclusion that this virus is natural. Yeah. And so that's what I would say um, is that I disagree with him based on my read of the evidence. Um, but Tom is right that I don't, I have not seen all of his evidence, but from all the evidence I have seen, there is no uh, so way to support um, anything and, other than this virus is natural. And there is no category of evidence that Mike Pompeo could have access to that would overturn what you're looking at. Right, exactly. Because this virus has been sequenced by multiple parties in and outside of China now who have all published the sequence. And we've got the data showing that this is not, it's just completely inconsistent with this having come out of the lab. It's hard to imagine what kind of evidence, just like Alan just said, it's, I can't imagine what evidence would uh, someone would have that would really be convincing otherwise. Right. This is really not politics at all. This is science. <laughs> Vincent, you also added a comment here. So I know he was asked subsequently by journalists what the uh, evidence was, and he denied that he ever made that statement. <laughs> right. So he walked it back. Now that's lies. So <laughs> I, I no, don't care that's, what you want to call it. That's uh, vacillating. Yeah. He, so this is this is in the public record, and all we're saying is the science says it came from nature, and we don't believe that he had any other data, and that's all we're saying. I don't care what his politics are. Uh, it's about science, Tom. Do not say this is a political opinion. It is not my. I don't give a damn about Mike Pompeo or anyone else in terms of their politics. I care about the science here. And if you think otherwise, you're wrong. <laughs> and it's really important that I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there coming from many different sources, and it's we have the mo one of the most important things we can do is to prevent the spread of misinformation, regardless of the source. Yes. Speaking of misinformation, uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? <laughs> sure. Mark writes, I write with a small correction to the email criticizing the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, IHME model, that Professor Racaniello read on the most recent episode of TWIV, episode 614. I am not in any way affiliated with the HIME, but I am, like the Institute, affiliated with the University of Washington not the University of Wisconsin, which the otherwise punctilious writer of the letter incorrectly identified as the IHME's host institution. So we did spread best. misinformation. <laughs> uh, best wishes, Mark. Yes. yes. Thank when you for we the correction, Mark. When we misinform, we uh, pony up yep. and say, Absolutely. we blew it. Here's the correct information. Wrong university, sorry. That's right. <laughs> they both start with W. They are both... Very esteemed inf uh, institutes that yes. one should be proud to be Even. from. Yes, but they are not interchangeable. No. You're next, Dixon. Yep. Owen writes, I'm a master's student currently working in a rotavirus lab. You actually interviewed my PI, Sarah McDonald, on a previous TWIV. I find myself constantly commiserating with my science friends about the ridiculousness of thinking SARS-CoV-2 came from a lab. Everyone in science, not just virologists, can appreciate how hard it is to get anything to work in the lab. I've spent 90% of my time in lab troubleshooting why my assays didn't work. The idea that someone could have engineered the current virus is absolutely ludicrous. I like to equate making a virus in a lab like making a campfire or a fire for a grill. Sometimes it's really hard for you to get a fire going. Sometimes you can't even get it going at all. And if you do, it gets blown out by the tiniest wind. However, viruses that evolve in nature from different selective pressures are like the wildfires in Australia and can spread far and wide with massive destructive force. 
I really like this because it, it really took me back to the laboratory and sort of, you know, compa- compounds all this. I remember so many times thinking, man, I am really an idiot. I just can't do any of this stuff, you know? <laughs> I can't do anything. Rich, I used to say if you have one test tube, you can't mislabel it, but if you have two, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> think, think about how many pages in a lab notebook you have, how many pieces yes. of data and how that compares to how many pieces of data are in the papers that you have published. Yeah, exactly. It's just mm-hmm. a huge ratio of stuff in the notebooks to stuff that gets published. Yeah. And Owen is about to start her PhD program at the University of Wisconsin. Speaking cool. of UWs. Yeah. Not Working the on RNA virus. Not the University of Wisconsin. Nice. That's right. Right. So I like this because – you know, this is how I was trained in, in a lab where things mostly don't work. And then in the last 10 years, you know, when people start accusing scientists of making viruses, I'm, I was so incredulous. I couldn't understand. I couldn't even explain to people. And this crystallizes it because yeah. we all we were all trained like this. And that's why we immediately go, nah. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's hard to right. explain to people. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, if if you've ever had to make a virus in a lab – you know this is not going on. So, you know, watching all the science fiction movies, though, it looks easy. Well, of course it does, yes. We we have Hollywood. too many Hollywood scripts in people's heads, right? Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah, but doing CRISPR looks easy, too, until <laughs> yes. I tried it. Yes. It's not so crisp, is it? Kathy, <laughs> Kathy no. you're next. Yes. Lad writes, in TWIV 613, you referenced the need for a person to acknowledge the limits of their knowledge. And Rich read a quotation from Socrates. Also a famous movie line from Dirty Harry, Clint Eastwood, in Magnum Force, 1973, a man's got to know his limitations. And he gives a link. Yes. Uh, I looked at this clip. It's outstanding. <laughs> it's excellent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me want to go back and watch all those movies. Hey. Owen, uh, hello. Oh, is it the same Owen? Maybe. Who knows? Hello we again. The same Owen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With the technology we possess today to do work without the need to be in the physical presence of others... What opinions might you be able to share on the subject of telework, promising a society that is better able to endure pandemics like the one we are now experiencing? Do you perhaps think that society might be dragging a chain, favoring the maintenance of an economic model made redundant by technology and hence unnecessarily increasing the transmission of viruses and other communicable pathogens? Well, I think there is a... um, certainly a place for telework. And I think we have learned, many of us have learned that um, uh, we can do an awful lot uh, on Zoom and other platforms. In fact, you can have meetings with anyone. It's amazing. And, and you know, if you try and schedule a real life meeting, it's almost impossible. I, I <laughs> taught easy. a virology class to a group of students in Nigeria this morning. Wow. Cool. Yeah, Which cool. I could never do without awesome. Zoom. However, However, I think humans need human contact, and they always will. That's how we evolved. And so I don't think it will replace uh, everything. And and I think that one thing we are learning through all of this um, is about some of the places where being in person is actually better than being on Zoom. Yeah, we can make do with Zoom, but something and some things we can see are better on Zoom, but also some things are not as good. And this is making that very clear. Yeah, I think a lot of people had not really seriously tried to use some of the newer methods like like Zoom or Skype or Google Meetings or whatever, whatever 20 or 30 other competitors are coming online now. Um, and now that they are, they're seeing there are real advantages to this. It is not necessarily the poor cousin of an in-person meeting. And for a lot of meetings, it does make more sense. But as you all just said, you know, that we are fundamentally tribal apes and we need to we need to get into the same room where we can smell each other um, <laughs> some, for, sometimes. Um, if you have corn, but I you can't smell them. God, what an image, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think what I'm seeing for scientific meetings is that there's this new appreciation of what can be done with the online platforms and stuff problems that meetings have struggled with for years. How do we increase accessibility? How do we improve the quality of the question and answer session? So it's not just a bunch of old guys running up to the mic to give additional speeches. Um, And you can do these things with online platforms. And I I think we may see 
post COVID-19 more hybrid meetings where you can attend in person or online, but the questions are all handled online, you know, where you try and try, try and bring in elements of both. That's true for that aspect of the meetings, but for the other aspect of the meetings where you introduce your trainee to another of senior scientist in the mm-hmm. coffee break line or those kinds of things you will never get from the Zoom meeting. Absolutely. Yeah. They're really yeah, I spent like most of my week now, Vincent. For a long time they yeah. have been, yeah. And that's been working out okay. I, I- long time. I spent yeah. most of my week uh, attending a conference over Zoom and was able to see both the things that I really liked, um, at, which had to do with the all of the different questions that were asked, but I did miss out on sort of meeting new people and the interactions that you would have during the coffee break. And it's, there's something, uh, it's just the pr- my primitive brain has a hard time with the virtual meeting thing, and it's exhausting. In, in a way that in-person meetings are not as exhausting. And I, I think some of it is the latency of lips are out of sync with sound. And some of it is just the whole talking to somebody who's who's not in the same room. Um, so, yeah, there are, there are definite downsides and there are definite limitations to this. But I, I think it has led to a whole new appreciation of ways that we could um, we could improve a lot of things. I had uh, I'm teaching a summer course starting next week and I've never had so many specialists lining up Columbia employees who are going to help me. Hmm. And this morning I had a conversation with a Zoom specialist. <laughs> nice. <laughs> who knew? And she said to me, "We're going to have a pre-flight discussion." I said, "Wow, we're going to fly." <laughs> <laughs> but I have pedagogical specialists, I have Zoom specialists, I have recording. And I said, you know, I've been teaching for 10 years. I never got any help. Uh, And now all of a sudden we're in a pandemic and look at that. But I tell you, these Zoom specialists, that's what she does for a living. She knows every millimeter of of the software and it's really amazing. There's a lot of stuff in there I didn't know about. So it's it's certainly um, opening my eyes. Uh, Rich, you're next. Lenny? Lenny. Yep. yep. Lenny gives a link to a site that we'll discuss and says, I'm a recent listener to your excellent podcast. When I saw this calculator posted May 13th, 2020 on the DHS website, I wondered what the experts would make of the instrument and its usefulness. And he links to uh, a site from the Department of Homeland Security that is Estimated natural decay of SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, on surfaces under a range of temperatures and relative humidity. And it is, I don't know, you know, from whence this originates. There's probably some uh, information on that. They had a couple of weeks ago, remember, and that coincided with the UV bleach nonsense. (laughs) Uh, Mm -hmm. The DHS... uh, uh, published some data on inactivation on different surfaces. So I think they have just made this calculator to take those data so you can put in your own numbers. And, right. So you can you know. choose a surface type, stainless steel or uh, and plastic or nitrile coming soon, it says for that. <laughs> you can dial in a temperature and a relative humidity, and it gives you an activation curve. What I really like is that uh, it includes, and I, I'm sure that this is theory based on some data, Right. Uh, theoretical calculation based on some data. What I like is that it puts in the half life. Mm-hmm. Yes, okay? because I think that's I think that's really important. People, and we've discussed this before. People say that uh, you know something can last on a surface for five days. Yeah, well, it could be that on day five you're down by five uh, five logs. Okay, so uh, knowing the half life, how fast it decays, and uh, how much is left after a certain interval of time in between one and five days is a, is a more informative number. And you can get that from this. So for example, they have the default settings, the 50% mark, the half-life is half a day, 99.99% of it has been uh, decayed is about seven days. You can play with the relative humidity and the temperature and look at these things change. Now, remember, 
so I think this is useful for people to do and get an idea. But remember, these are based on idealized mm -hmm. laboratory conditions, right? Where they're pipetting a lot of virus onto the surface and they're measuring it at different times, different temperatures, different humidities. But nevertheless, you could say at 95 Fahrenheit, 60% humidity, uh, the half-life is two and a half hours. <laughs> they need uh, some more surface types in here, like a beer can. Oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> or a tennis ball. Right. Mm -hmm. Or right? your Card mail. Cardboard. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Or a zinc I, bar I surface. Uh, interesting. Thanks, Lenny. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Alan, you're next. Uh, oh. Oh, yeah. So now we have letters from Swedes. And they have some thoughts. Uh, and I, I maybe there's some Swedish tendency to write long letters because these are long letters. Uh, or maybe it's just that we've really touched a nerve here. Um, anyway, so I will start with uh, Jakob. Um, who is a Swedish citizen. Who is a Swedish citizen, yes. Um, and uh, this is in response to letters on TWIV 614. Um, talking about Sweden's response not being so great. And Jakob says, uh, it's certainly true we do have much higher death rates than our neighboring countries, and I think that it is clear to everyone why. I would still argue that just under 4,000 dead from the current pandemic is far from catastrophic in light of historic pandemics without prior immunity. I would also like to add that every death is a heavy loss for family and friends, and no Swede is oblivious to this. The Swedish model is not callously disregarding the deaths that has, have occurred so far, but see, sees them in the light of an alternative cost. Uh, not cost as in just dollars of your, or euros, but cost to our society and our way of life. How many lives will be lost as direct and indirect consequences of shutting down our modern global economy? What happens to the factory workers in developing countries when enormous demand for new stuff suddenly disappears? Will better off countries send needed help while they themselves face severe economic depression? It is true that we have a strong consensus culture in Sweden and that people are punished unfairly for speaking out against the majority view. This is, of course, not good, but being unjustly attacked does not impact if your opinion is or, or statement is right or wrong. I think that the critics are right in that Sweden could have done a much more could have done much more to prevent the spread of the virus i just think in in doing so we would be in a worse situation and i think that we see the effects of this around the world um finally i'd like to know your thoughts on this paper and sends um a paper a link to a paper from cell um Targets of T-cell responses to SARS-CoV-2 in humans with COVID-19 disease and unexposed. Uh, this is, we're going to do this paper in a subsequent episode, right? This is from yeah, we're right. the okay. SETI lab. With, uh, John, you All right, so stay tuned for that part. Well, I, we should point out, Alan, that the letters have been coming from listeners who have some connection with Sweden. Yes. It's not our opinion, right? Right, yeah. So this is... I, we initially, we got uh, some letters from people saying, you know, look at Sweden's approach um, and and we didn't shut things down and look how great it's going. And then we got letters from Sweden saying, actually, it's not going so great. And um, but uh, but, you know, there's been uh, there's been a lot of backlash against people pointing that out. Uh, so now we're getting more letters from Swedes um, saying that that is, you know, that there are two sides to this. Yeah. So basically, really? TWIV has become a uh, mini platform for this uh, debate about the yes. Swedish model among Swedes. And that's fine because, in fact, uh, uh, you know, we're not going to know until long after this is over uh, what actually happened. And people, you know, people are treating it in different ways and it'll be informative for the future. So we'll keep our eyes open. And we need to hear from Swedes about what is going on yes, instead exactly. of us trying to yes. guess what's going right. on. But as we see, uh, we get different stories, sure. and different opinions. I do, I do think that uh, wh however things are transpiring in Sweden, that their model would not export to the U.S. Because their health system I mean, is so radically more prepared than ours for. Yeah, I think we mentioned yeah, that I mean, that's Yes, in fact, you mentioned that. Yeah. You know. Whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about the Swedish system, I, I don't think that that's something that we can we can apply here or in many other countries. Uh, Brienne, can you take the next one? Sure. Uh, Carolina writes, I am a virologist from Sweden, currently living and working in the U.S. 
um, and she gives uh, a few um, thoughts of things that are distinctly different in the Swedish approach compared to other countries. One, the officials of the Public Health Agency of Sweden insist on promulgating the message that SARS-CoV-2 infected people do not transmit disease prior to the development of clinical signs of disease. Hmm. Um, Two, the same officials strongly discourage the use of face masks for anyone other than healthcare workers that are in direct contact with suspected or confirmed COVID patients. They claim this is due to the lack of scientific evidence in support of protection provided by widespread mask usage. You know what? This just sounds like the United States before some of these things were shown not to be true. It's right. like yeah. they're yeah. behind on the curve. Yeah. I am also thinking this part, no PPE unless dealing with confirmed suspect cases, may have had substantial impact on how COVID-19 made it into the majority of care home facilities for the elderly, which seems to be the great big question that no one can figure out as visits to these facilities by family and friends was banned quite early on. Another thing that has caught my eye has been widespread promulgation of outcomes of mathematical modeling on very limited data suggesting that herd immunity will be reached within the near future, at least in Stockholm. Although I am not an epidemiologist, I find it very hard to believe that the Swedish seroprevalence could far surpass levels reported from um, New York or Spain. I am seriously torn as I have a lot of respect for the Public Health Agency of Sweden and the work that they normally do. I definitely do not adhere to the elsewhere communicated notion of these officials as being talentless. But it does seem that they may be failing in updating policies and guidelines as more scientific knowledge is gained. Um, so I would say uh, from Carolina or Carolina um, that it, many of the things that you mention here do sound just like Kathy said as things that were happening in the U.S. Um, and that we have since updated. Um, you know, these were some of the earlier decisions we were making, and hopefully some of them will get updated. Um, Dixon, can you take Otto? Otto writes, I was quite shocked when I heard the letter from Worried About Sweden in TWIV 614, because several of the claims are false, are definitely not something that should have been, should have seen the light of day in respected scientific podcast. I sincerely hope that you would make an attempt to give an accurate and objective view on the Swedish strategy for inviting the state epidemiology by inviting the state epidemiologist Dr. Anders Tegno to the podcast. He was recently interviewed in the, on the Daily Show by Trevor Noah. There are also other relevant experts without connection to the authority or the 22 researchers such as Professor Agnes Wold or Dr. Emma Franz. The deaths per million is indeed high in Sweden, but cherry-picking data based on a three-day average comparing countries who may be in different phases in the pandemic is not a fair comparison. The so-called 22 researchers that have expressed a critical concern in media have also been found making false and inappropriate claims, such as cherry-picking data to compare Sweden and Italy using input to the Imperial College model as an outcome of the model, and maybe worst, calling the officials talentless. Mm, Harsh words. The letters refer to the media sources. uh, I'll read this again. The letter refers to the media source in the New York Times, right? No, no, no. Samnet.se. <laughs> All right, I, I got confused. Samnet.se, which is a Swedish publication, obviously, which is a radical nationalist news source known for having connections to Russian intelligence and repeatedly spreading fake news. My goodness. Who would have guessed? All right. Look, I mean, he suggested that we peer review the letter, but this is a podcast where listeners write in right. that's absurd <laughs> and there are going to be things said that are wrong and we apologize because we can't check out every email but we appreciate the correct and there are going to be things said that are interpretations and there are going to be disagreements about those but we won't necessarily know um because we're not from there as the next letter so aptly points out yes <laughs> 
Last one, Kathy. Rose writes, I want to let you know that statistics quoted in one of the letters you read on episode 614 were completely wrong. The deaths per million in Sweden are not worse than Italy, UK, or the US, and I think it is very important that erroneous statistics be corrected on the air instead of just read. I've attached a screenshot of the stats as of today. Listeners trust you so much that an error not corrected will be assumed to be true. So we have this corrected this table with statistics, and this will be in the letters read section that you can find on the web page for every episode. So there you have it. This is, these are deaths per million. Okay, now deaths per million in Sweden on this chart are still higher than deaths per million in the United States yeah, and Switzerland and a number of other countries. So. But lower than but UK lower than, and But lower Spain. than um, UK and Spain and Italy. Yeah. And Italy. Now, this, this looks like it comes from uh, a Swedish site. It says health and pharmaceutical state of health, but I'm not sure what the I, source of this is. So. Um, yeah, I'm guessing this is maybe from their from the official public health site, but I don't know. The, the link is not provided. So this is an interesting situation that we find ourselves in. People write in from countries, and you know they may say things that are wrong, and we can't control it very much. But I think we it's can't. great that we actually have enough listeners from there that we can get the, yeah. the diversity of positions on this. Yeah, eventually, it'll correct yeah, itself. Sure. That's true. Sure. And I yeah, think so. by the way, Rose is from California, and it would be helpful since this was a screenshot for us to know what the source of it was, yes. because we'll probably have some listeners writing into us and complaining that we have now put in data, <laughs> yes. data in quotation marks for which we have no reference. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have more about Sweden. Yep. You betcha. And someday we'll uh, have real uh, long term data. Yes. To have a better idea, uh, you know, how all this has worked out in different locations. So you, you should stick around and keep yes. listening because this is going to be really interesting. All right. Don't go away. Uh, where where should you not go away from? Microbe.tv slash twiv. That's where you can find the show notes, all the letters, full text. You listen on a phone or tablet, and we'd like you to subscribe. If you want to send us a question or comment, twiv at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. There are a number of ways where you could give us a few bucks a month to support our activities. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thanks, Dixon. And you're quite welcome, Vincent. This was um, very entertaining and interesting. Did you learn something, Dixon? Lots. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Brian Barker is at Drew University on the Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. It was great to be here. I learned a lot too. Very good. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit, Meredith Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Uh, always a good time. I'm exhausted. I think I need to go take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> You're sleepy. <laughs> Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com over on Twitter. He's Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>